morning. Can everybody hear me back there? Yeah. All right. Well, first off, welcome to the uh, TriMet Board of Directors meeting. Um, before we actually start the meeting, I wanted to give a little uh, uh, introduction about how the meeting is going to be going on this morning. Um, and also to remind folks, before you forget, I want, want you to know that the parking lot north of City Hall, across from the Max tracks here, has a three-hour parking limit. And if you parked in that lot and will be visiting this area for over three hours, please move your vehicle to the parking garage, which is over here, because if you're there over three hours, you will be towed. So I want to make sure that you're, everybody who's there uh, is aware of that. All right? So now on to the, uh, the meeting here. First off, uh, I'm Bruce Warner. I'm the president of the uh, TriMet Board of Directors. I want to welcome you all here to Beaverton City Hall. Um, and from time to time, uh, many of you know that we hold our meetings in communities we serve uh, in the, in the Tri-County metropolitan area. Uh, and we are excited to be here because it's an opportunity to, to visit with some of our uh, uh, partner governments and stakeholders out here on the west side. Um, and I'd like to uh, first ask the, uh, the board of directors to introduce themselves to you and tell you which areas of the region they represent. So maybe I'll start over here with Director Prosser. Hi, I'm Craig Prosser. I represent District 7, which is basically um, Clackamas County. I'm Lori Bauman. I represent District 4, which is southeast Portland. Good morning, I'm Travis Stovall. I represent District 6, which is East Multnomah County, including the cities of Gresham, Troutdale, Woods Village, and Fairview. Good morning, T. Allen Bethel, Northeast Portland, District 5. Linda Simmons, District 3, which is part of Southwest Portland, um, South Beaverton, Tigard, uh, and Tualatin. I'm Joe Esmond from District 2. Uh, Encompass, my district encompasses parts of southwest Portland, including downtown North Portland, and down, in, down along the northwest in the industrial area out that way. Good. And again, I'm Bruce Warner. My district is number one, which is the rest of Washington County that's not covered by uh, the Director Simmons uh, uh, district, which is, in essence, Beaverton from about uh, uh, Murray Boulevard all the way west to Hillsborough, Cornelius Forest Grove. So it gives you an idea of, of the areas that we uh, actually represent, but I think when you're going to find out when you listen to our meetings, we are looking at the district as a whole when we're sitting up here as, as the board of directors. So um, what I want to do uh, uh, is let you know how we're going to move forward this morning. We're first going to begin with some remarks from the city of Beaverton, because that's where we are. As soon as they finish, uh, we will open the public forum to allow people to give testimony, and I do have three people who've signed up for the public uh, forum at this time. And if the public forum ends earlier than 45 minutes, which is usually allotted for that, we will move directly to our board uh, business meeting uh, with reports from our board members, and then reports from the general manager, and then right into the actual business that we actually need to take action on this morning. So with that, unless there's questions or comments from the board, let's get started. So my understanding is uh, that the mayor, uh, Denny Doyle, could not be with us this morning, but we have a good stand-in. Uh, Beaverton is a, is a strong partner with, uh, with uh, TriMet, and we're glad that we're here. So I'd like to uh, bring up the mayor's chief administrative officer, Randy Ely, who has some remarks today. Good morning, Randy. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Beaverton. My name is Randy Ely. I am the chief administrative officer here at the city. Uh, and I also serve as, uh, by charter as mayor pro tem in our strong mayor form of government. Um, wanted to welcome you with open arms. Uh, thank you for having your meeting here at the city of Beaverton. Director, or President Warner and uh, members of the board, you are sitting in uh, Beaverton City Hall, which we purchased a unique story out of bankruptcy uh, several years back. Um, and uh, it's just a great story, but I wanted to, the reason I bring it up is because we purposefully picked this area because of access to rail, uh, max, light rail. Uh, numbers provided by your staff to our staff show that Beaverton Transit Center, Beaverton Central is one of the busiest, if not the busiest, of your service uh, areas in the region with approximately 26,800 ons and 25,800 offs on any given average weekday. Those numbers are from this past spring. 
I don't know how many cars, there's probably somebody, an actuary or something that has calculated how many cars that keeps off the road and helps with congestion. And, uh, but we do have a number of our employees who are biking to work, who are um, coming from Portland around the region and, um, and using the service. So this building, uh, we rent out two floors. So we're making about a million dollars a year in payback to pay off the debt that we used to purchase this building. Congresswoman Bonamici's headquarters is here on the second floor, as well as our Washington County Visitors Association. Um, I wanted to say, uh, Bruce uh, and Craig, uh, thank you personally, because uh, when I worked at Metro and I was a little wet behind the ears, 25 years old, you two kind of <laughs> took me under your wing, and I, I'll never forget that. I really appreciate your, your mentorship in my career and, and helping. Um, before I wrap up, thank you. Congratulations on the transportation package in Salem. Just so you know, in Beaverton, that means about two million additional dollars in the first year, possibly getting up to around six million per year that goes directly back into our streets. So um, a pat on the back, a congratulatory note, the transportation package was robust, and in and, and Beaverton specifically, we are celebrating. But as you know, the work isn't done. So we want to, I'm here today, on behalf of our leadership, our city council and our mayor, to express our hand in collaborating with you in landing the Southwest Corridor project, moving on to the next phase. Uh, mayor Doyle, active participant with the other mayors around the region and the, and the stakeholders. So we stand ready. We have, frankly, the employers, 3%, uh, less than 3% unemployment rate, Nike, Columbia, Intel. The employers are here, they are paying it, they are the ones that are needing it, and um, we stand ready to work together with you because Beaverton, and Washington County in particular, the Beaverton way is density, vertical housing, transit-oriented development. We're doing all those things actively right now. Westgate's about to kick off with the transit-oriented de development mixed housing, all income levels. Um, a few updates of what we're up to in Beaverton before I sign off that's very exciting. South Cooper Mountain, the south part of our city, is about to create 3,000 units, opening a new high school and welcoming 10,000 new residents. So when we hear the, the talk of last mile solutions, we're very interested in working with you on providing that out there to that area. Just to the south of that even, uh, in River Terrace, Tigard is taking off with new housing choices and we need some uh, transit solutions out there as well. Nike is about to hit the one billion mark in their, their expansion of their project right here in Washington County. Uh, most if, uh, of the, uh, the other areas that they're working on fall into our city limits. So we welcome Nike and their expansion, their North American headquarters right here in Beaverton, Oregon. Um, I'll sign off by saying that we are working on a, a regional Center for the Performing Arts in Beaverton, which is funded by transient lodging tax, in particular paying back the debt on that project. And we hope that lots of writers come in uh, to enjoy a show when we have opening night uh, on your system. So thank you for being here. Welcome to Beaverton. And uh, we hope you have a, a great meeting. And uh, we're very appreciative of your time. Thank you, Randy. Thank you. It's great to see you out here in Washington County. And thanks for your comments. And, and thanks to the city for really stepping up in terms of looking at ways to, to build in a, in a way that's supportive to tra of transit. And it's nice to hear, and we're hearing it more and more everywhere, that transit is important and we want it, and we want more of it. And so I think we heard yeah. that a lot this morning in our reception. So again, please pass on our thanks to the mayor for allowing well, us to have this meeting here and the rest of your city council. Uh, uh, yes, it sir. is greatly appreciated. Thank you very much. Great, so with that, we're gonna move right into our public forum. Uh, for those of you who have, have not been to our meetings or maybe watching on TV for the first time, we, have, we set aside 45 minutes in the beginning of our uh, meetings to allow uh, citizens, stakeholder groups, others to uh, discuss issues of, of concern uh, they may have with TriMet to the TriMet board, which includes things that are on the agenda today. Uh, we, uh, individual comments, uh, we, we are limiting them to two to three minutes depending on the amount of speakers. Uh, uh, and, uh, and in this case, we only have three people signed up, so I think we can go up to three, three minutes on that. 
Uh, if individuals wish to share additional information, they may complete a comment card that will be provided to the board and made part of the board record. And uh, we will uh, also be taking, making these, uh, calling people up in the order of their sign up. And we have uh, usually about a half hour, 45 minutes of time before the meetings begin so people can sign up and we'll take them in the order in which they, as I said, uh, uh, sign up. Uh, and if individuals have issues that are not within the jurisdiction of the TriMet board, uh, hopefully TriMet staff will be able to, to listen and, and maybe funnel you to the uh, right people to address your concerns. So with that, I'm going to get right into the public forum. Uh, the first uh, person we have signed up is Chris Walker, who is from our Committee on Accessible Transportation, and David Bruchard uh, with Bus, Bus Riders Unite. Uh, just a minute, Chris, maybe we get uh, David up here first, too. He's, to your left, to your, to your right, excuse me, right, excuse me, wrong, wrong way. <laughs> yeah. All right. There you go. All right, Chris. Um, good morning, uh, Bruce and board members. Um, this morning I want to talk about um, Washington County and the, as you heard before, the mayor, uh, the spokesman, I would, we're growing, and so is uh, Hillsboro with Intel, and there's just so much more need for bus service, and there's a lot of boundaries that were restricted when we had our down uh, downtime with the recession and all that I think would be important for you guys to go back and visit so that people would be able to get around better because I've uh, riding Lyft and uh, hear you, I hear a lot of different uh, comments about how hard it is to organize your day if you're having to meet a bus somewhere for your first ride and uh, figuring out all those details out and in the, uh, the evening as well. So those are uh, some things that uh, need to be uh, worked on, and uh, I'll just limit, limit it to that, and I wrote you guys a note, so uh, I should be getting that. Thank you, Chris. I would note for the board, if you didn't see, there is, there is some correspondence from you and some, some answers that are in the uh, back of our packet uh, regarding some of the problems you were having, so thank you for bringing those to our attention. Hopefully we'll be able to resolve some of those for you. Thanks. David. Good morning. Um, <clears throat> I'm here today, I'm David Bouchard, um, and I'm here to really to represent myself, um, just for disclosure, but I'm sure Bus Riders Unite um, also feels the same way about better uh, nighttime service and um, off-peak service in general um, is somewhat lacking and uh, th there could be a lot of improvements um, which you'll probably hear about, you know, in the coming months, I'm sure. But I'll give you an example of a of a problem that I see as the um, Max Yellow Line trains after midnight on weekdays uh, like to go to Rose Quarter and then uh, go eastbound to return to the yard at Gresham, I'm assuming, out to Ruby Junction, but. Um, you know, there are people who want to continue to go south uh, and, you know, either straight south or southwest or, or any other direction. Uh, and they're really, you know, after, for, I'll give you an example. I've gone from Vancouver, uh, Washington quite a bit to, uh, late in the evening after seeing my girlfriend there. And you, you get on a train, you know, you, you may get on a, on a train at, at midnight. You get downtown. I live at 11th and Jefferson. You, when you get to the Rose Quarter, you know, the only way to get from there, you know, to that, to across the river is to either walk or wait another 40 minutes for the last number four. So it, it, that's just an example. But when you have your, you know, when you're looking at your nighttime service, especially, you know, I know there are operational efficiency, you know, benefits to, you know, turning the trains and getting them back to the yard at that time of night. But, you know, you do need to consider 
you know, the people are still making the same types of trips that they were making during the day. And if you're not going to provide the rail service, then you need to coordinate, you know, bus lines to, to fulfill that, that possible demand. And, you know, the, one of the reasons that ridership is probably so low at night uh, on an end off peak is because of the service. Um, if, if you provide more service and you focus on really trying to provide more frequent service during those off-peak times, I think that your ridership will go up, people will feel more secure, and that they can rely on the system, will feel safer while waiting because they won't be waiting as long, the vehicles will be uh, more crowded, so activity that, you know, might be, a, you know, might slip under the radar in an empty MAX train, for instance, is going to be, um, you know, the, the other passengers are going to be more eyes and ears. So, you know, please do start to be considering of that uh, or continue to consider it if you already are. I'm sure, you, I'm sure people in this room are uh, because that's really going to be a big push now that the transportation package has been passed. We really need to improve off-peak bus service frequency and span. Thank you. Thank you, David. Very thoughtful comment. Maybe I could ask the general manager to maybe give us some comments after we're, after we're done with the public forum here and his general manager's reports. But I would point out, actually, the general manager and I were at a, a, a worldwide transit uh, conference where some of the areas, uh, bigger jurisdictions around the world, are actually starting to change some of their evening uh, commute uh, 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 availability uh, with interesting results. So maybe I could ask you to comment a little bit on that. When we get there. Okay. And then the last person we have signed up today is Julie Reardon from Portland. Good morning. Good morning. Um, my name is Julie. I live in outer southeast Portland. Um, I am also currently a volunteer with Opal Environmental Justice. Um, I've spent the last couple months bus organizing um, for Bus Riders Unite, getting on the max, getting on the trains, and talking to folks um, about their experiences, um, promoting our low-income fare and campaign, and um, also talking to people about uh, safety and what makes them feel safe when they're riding transit. Last night we held a forum in downtown and a lot of folks showed up and we listed out from the group the different suggestions that people had that would make them feel safe on transit and not one of those suggestions was an armed police officer. Um, these were mostly low income folks, uh, houseless folks, people who are feeling targeted by transit cops and um, fair enforcers when they're riding. Um, we realize that, or I realize that we have the low income fare is gonna be happening, but it's not happening until 2019. And um, right, I'm pretty sure that's what you guys said, that it would be 2019. And so I just am here to say that I urge you to um, implement it sooner because people need it now and um, also to recognize the folks that are feeling targeted and to do a better job of reaching out to those people in the community. You know, not everybody has access to the internet or smartphones, they can't all go online and take surveys. Um, and I think that it's really important for you guys to recognize the most vulnerable people in our community. Good, thank you very much for your comments, good, good comments. Maybe Mr. General Manager, I could ask you to give us a Quick update on just what you think the implementation timing might be. Oh, good. Okay, excellent, excellent. So, if you want to hang around, we can give you the latest, the, the schedule, so we actually understand exactly what it is. All right. Thank you. All right. That's all I have signed up for the public forum. So, with that, I'm going to close the public forum, and we're going to move right to our regular business meeting. So, I'm going to call the uh, TriMet Board of Directors meeting. Uh, for July 26, 2017 to order. And the first items on the agenda are the board reports. And the first one is from the Committee on Accessible Transportation, uh, Director Bauman. Yes, thank you. Good morning. 
Uh, the CAT met last week on July 19th, and here is a short report on that meeting. Uh, there was uh, first a report from Lieutenant Rachel Andrew about the um, transit police activity. Um, secondly, the uh, CAT uh, voted to continue or to, um, uh, for a sec, for a, the next term of the chairmanship of the CAT, they uh, voted in uh, Jan Campbell. She's going to continue in that role for one more term. Uh, Dan Bauer, uh, the executive director of the Portland Streetcar, uh, attended and answered a number of questions and talked about, in particular, challenges around uh, malfunctioning um, bridge plates on the streetcars and some of their changes in policy and operating streetcars where those bridge plates are not functioning. Uh, Alan Lado uh, spoke about the um, fiscal year 2018 business plan and received some feedback from CAT members on that. And then finally, there were lift reports. Eileen Collins gave a report on uh, lift performance in the months of May and June. Damon Blocker reported on the cycle of a life of a lift trip, and. Uh, Eileen uh, Collins, in addition, solicited participation of the CAT committee in an upcoming emergency preparedness drill. And that's the report. That's a very succinct report. Thank you. I, I did will point out that whoever did the minutes this, this month for your, uh, your committee really outdid themselves in terms <laughs> really of Really a lot of detail. There was a lot of detail yeah. there, but it was interesting yeah. to read. So we probably won't see that every month, but thank you for the, mm -hmm. for the uh, shorter report. Any questions of, uh, for the director? All right, then let's move on to the Metro Policy Advisory Committee, uh, MPAC, uh, Director Prosser. Yeah, at the last meeting of, of MPAC, uh, we had a briefing on um, Metro's uh, work updating the, the regional transit plan. That is a, a, a project that's been ongoing for um, several months now and uh, will be finished up. It'll, we're about, third to a half of the way, way through the, the um, project. Um, primarily it involves updating the existing regional transit plan to reflect uh, current projects, um, either in process or, or on, on the drawing boards, um, removing some that are no longer going forward, such as the Lake Oswego trolley. Um, and then also to uh, reflect um, current plans um, with, um, climate, smart communities, um, that type of thing. Um, the impact did discuss, um, you know, various aspects of that. One of the items that came up, and Randy had mentioned how last mile is, is of growing importance in the Beaverton area, that is a concern throughout the region. And uh, impact did suggest that uh, Metro take a look at the regional transit plan in terms of last mile and, and what the plan can do to encourage uh, actions to improve uh, access to existing lines. Um, the board, our board, will be uh, receiving a briefing next month, as I understand it, from our staff in greater detail. So I think you know that'll give you a pretty good idea of, of what's going on there. Um, we also had a briefing on, on uh, Metro's efforts to update the so, uh, regional solid waste management plan um, of limited interest to us, but there they are, working away. So um, that's all. Thank you. That's a good report. Any questions of Director Prosser? All right, seeing none, then I'm going to move right on to the general manager's uh, report. Mr. General Manager. Mr. Board President, members of the board, and everyone here, um, uh, I wanted to just pass on my greetings to all of our West Side uh, colleagues and friends. Um, I do see Commissioner, did see Commissioner Malinowski here, uh, as well as uh, uh, obviously Pam Trees from the West Side Economic Alliance, and a number of other uh, important, Luann Pelton, who was a uh, a longtime uh, member of our budget advisory committee during some very difficult times. So we have a lot of friends here and a lot of uh, colleagues and supporters and I'm pleased to see them here. So thank you again to the city of Beaverton and everyone on the west side for hosting us here today. 
Um, and I, I wanted to also just, I know Mayor Dora couldn't be here, but I would just tell you there's no greater champion for uh, TriMet uh, and the work that we do than Mayor Doyle. Um, just a very brief report, saw him last Thursday at the JPAC meeting, and he was actually uh, extolling the virtues of the Low Income Fair program and task force with Pam and he and many other uh, representatives from the West Side, obviously, a board president served on, and uh, you know what a great program that is. He's beginning to talk it up at a national level as a great solution to some of the equity issues that our region faces. So, again, um, a, a real champion here in the city of Beaverton for what we do. I'm very pleased to be working with him and partnering with him on many, many things. Um, wanted to start my report with ridership. Uh, when we compare June of this year with last year, we were down in ridership a little less than 1%. Most of that has, can translate back to reduced ridership on the MAC system during the, the two um, Rose Festival parades. Ridership on and, and attendance of the parades were down this year compared to previous years. Um, so we do see some so a, a trend associated with that. Uh, when we do look a little closer at the numbers, we see that bus ridership was basically flat. The peak hour for bus ridership was up just very slightly. But again, max was down a bit, 2.3 uh, for weekly ridership numbers on average, uh, as was Wes. And again, I think a lot of that had to do with parade attendance and ridership. Um, and I just wanted to... Uh, uh, elaborate just a little bit more on the ridership, uh, we'll be bringing to you a much more thorough report of our sort of studies over the last year about ridership and the trends and what is affecting ridership. And I think I'll, I'll just shortcut it a little bit to say that there is not one thing that is affecting ridership. You know, there's uh, fairly interesting and, and perhaps even dramatic uh, demographic changes. There's changes in the workforce. There are changes in people's perceptions. There's lots of um, lots of other uh, issues, including how our service meets the needs of individuals, and you heard David and others speak to that, and I'll get back to that in just a moment. So there's, um, there's a number of different factors that come into play, uh, which of course makes it a comprehensive problem to solve, not one where there is an easy fix in, any, uh, in, one in terms of reversing those trends. Uh, but I'm convinced that, that we, uh, we can identify those and share those with you. And uh, as we look toward future investments, we can begin to aim uh, a certain portion of those uh, to ridership uh, 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 service and growth. Um, just another sort of telling statistics that tells us the job that we have at hand is that for the fifth straight year in 2016, the Federal uh, Highway Administration reported another increase in vehicle miles traveled in the region. So that's sort of reversing some trends we saw from earlier in this decade. Um, and this, you should know, is also very much a, um, a national phenomenon. There are a lot of properties that, frankly, would love to see ridership down 1% because they're in double digits in terms of the reductions. So um, I think we have to be um, key. I also will you know, uh, transition here shortly to report on the launch of the HOP FastPass system, but have obviously some hope that with easier payment mechanisms that fit the lifestyle of today's riders that we can actually, um, we can actually uh, reverse uh, some of those trends and really make it easy to ride. Um, re regarding uh, a couple of the comments that were made in public forum, um, we, we will be looking at off-peak service uh, related to our future investments and uh, we'll talk a lot more about that. We actually have programmed uh, uh, Jarrett Walker, uh, a book I know uh, board board mem uh, uh, board, uh, one of our board members have, have um, uh, studied at some level. Um, he'll be actually leading us through sort of the, the trade-offs between different kinds of service, express service, more frequent service, more off-peak service. And there are trade-offs associated with ridership with all of those notions and general system productivity. Um, so one of the interesting trends is, is trying to, and, and um, Mr. Bouchard mentioned this, which is that, you know, and for example, our orange line service, we do terminate it a little bit early, but we extend an orange line bus to make those trips continue. So those may be beginning to match the level of demand with the right product. Uh, obviously, Max does a great job during the day on peak hours, commutes, but um, the, the need to, frankly, get the 
cars back to the barn so there's time to work on them and to have some time to work on the right of way all uh, lead us to uh, some uh, sort of focus on the efficiency and re and producing some time that our tr our staff actually has to, to do repair and preventive maintenance work on both the vehicles and the and the and the right of way. So those are some of the challenges, but there are solutions as noted, and I think what we've done on the Orange Line um, in order to provide that continuation of service with buses is one of the solutions that we can look at um, and, and will as we. Um, as we uh, advance future <coughs> service plans. Um, Mr. Board President, were there any questions about that part of the, or any other observations you wanted to share? I don't think so. I think the, uh, the, the question about the off-peak was, it sounds like we can have an opportunity to really engage in that in a big way at our, yeah. our retreat, is what you're saying. Right, so and we'll, we'll be able to look at the trade-offs. Uh, yeah, there's I think obviously really trade-offs of any dollar that we put in service, so I think that's an important conversation to have. Good. Director Esmond? I wonder if we, excuse me, if we can get the figures from the employers in the just in, in the our, our region who have swing shifts or what we call in construction world graveyard shifts, mm -hmm. and um, get an idea of how many of those people we need to help out. I'm sure it's not an overnight yeah. answer, but. Uh, yeah, and I would just note that our service planners do c collect that information. We've worked with a number of the employer associations, including Westside Economic Alliance uh, and others, to actually get that data from major employers. Um, I'm also aware of a recent uh, series of uh, uh, work that was done with the Columbia Corridor Association, sort of doing the same thing. So, yeah, absolutely, we do have um, we do have a lot of that information. Another area where that's come into play, frankly, is service to the Portland International Airport. Um, and while we have great service to the airport through the NAC system, there are limited hours for that service. It's a pretty wide span, but there are a lot of people who need to get right. to the airport, like at 2 a.m. or 3 yeah. a.m. And um, those, th that tends to be a problem for us as well in, in terms of service and for those, those employees. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Well, let me then transition. I'd ask uh, JC and Ryan uh, to come up. Um, but last week we officially launched the new Hot Pass Pass. You know, notice my button. I'm uh, I'm I'm branded appropriately. JC would be very proud of me. Um, but just to note that this is a system that allows uh, very easy access to our fare system. It allows our customers to move seamlessly between TriMet, C-Tran, and Portland Streetcar uh, with one single payment method. Um, it was in all a $34 million project that ended uh, uh, on time and on, under budget. So we're very proud of that. And as the board knows, we initiated this at a point in time when there was not a lot of public confidence in new big in, um, IT sorts of problems, uh, given some of the issues at the state level. Um, and uh, with your help and guidance, we had some independent reviews along the way that sort of made sure that we were uh, coming in for a smooth landing. And indeed, it has been a very smooth landing. I have great compliments to our team for the work that they've done in bringing this in. Uh, literally, the launches of these systems in other cities has been, have been, um, I want to use the term uh, like combat, uh, sort of bloody, uh, difficult uh, in many different ways. And, here, uh, barely a ripple, and indeed many customers are really excited about this, and we have some anecdotal information that we'll share with you in terms of its use and customer acceptance. Um, so again, uh, I just wanted to know, as note that we had uh, dozens of our partners in putting this project together uh, at our launch, and um, it was a, a very big milestone. Uh, we have here uh, Ryan Schraub, our manager of fair revenue, and J.C. Veneta, our director of communications, to give you a little bit of an update on that rollout. So, Ryan. Perfect. Thank you. Good morning, uh, President Warner and members of the board. I'm Ryan Schaub, manager of fair revenue, and I've been working with Chris Tucker on the Hot Fast Pass project since 2012. He's traveling today and regrets he can't be here to help share this good news. Um, we are pleased to report a very successful launch of Hot Fast Pass. Uh, and it's nice to sit here five years later and report a highly technical, <coughs> financial, and regional project is both on time and on budget, as you mentioned. As you know, it's a state-of-the-art fair collection system where customers can seamlessly tap, 
their smart card to pay across the transit systems of three agencies, TriMet, CTRAN, and Streetcar. We entered a beta test phase this February and ended in June with over 5,000 users using real money. Overwhelmingly, the testers reported they loved the system. There were a few issues that we discovered in beta, but we were able to address them quickly and uh, get the system ready for launch. More importantly, our testers provided feedback that allowed us to tweak the system and make it even more user-friendly. Beta testers were overwhelmingly satisfied and are satisfied with a system that rivals some of the top in the world, like London TFL. Starting on July 5th, hop cards were available to the public in retail stores like Fred Meyer, Safeway, and other independent retailers. The following two weeks, we focused on training hundreds of store clerks on how to sell cards and load value for those customers. We'll continue to onboard more retailers over the next nine months and reach out to more stores to hit our target of 500. Plaid Pantry was a welcomed late addition and they're now in production testing. On July 17th, that was our big day, we officially launched Hop Fast Pass with a very successful media event. It's nice to see Hop reports to viewers in such a positive light. We're very excited for the public to experience Hop. They can load money through many convenient sales channels such as retail stores, our website, mobile app for both Android and iOS, an automated phone system, regional transit stores, and our call center. Since July 5th, there have been over 100,000 taps on the system by both riders and employees, close to $175,000 in loads of value, and we estimate a few thousand cards have been sold already. The system is intuitive, as demonstrated by the very few calls received to date by our call center. Launch has been seamless, and we are very pleased with public enthusiasm for it. The system will continue to deliver exciting new features in months and years ahead, such as the ability to tap and pay with mobile wallets like Apple Pay, Android Pay, and Samsung Pay, and that's currently in beta. We will be integrating with our ticket vending machines, converting institutions to hop, and rolling out hop to our Lyft and paratransit customers. As customer adoption rates increase, we'll touch back with the board and prepare for a full transition away from paper products. Thank you for your time today, and with that, I'll hand it over to you, Jason. Thanks, Ryan. Ryan has the, the more difficult part of the job. I get the fun part, so let's talk <laughs> about that. Uh, so we did launch on the 17th. Uh, the picture showed up on the screen, um, and we officially tapped on the system. We got a lot of media coverage about it, and it was a great day, a great way to launch. Um, so um, one area that Ryan did touch on was our transition to our uh, corporate pass programs. This is in beta. We have just under 1,000 programs that we need to convert over the next 12 months. We have five companies in beta for our monthly and annual passes. Uh, PSU, a uh, portion of folks testing the beta the summer term. And this fall, September-ish, we'll be doing the beta test for our universal pass program. So there's a lot of training ahead, getting cards into people's hands, working with transit coordinators to get them prepped and ready for this conversion. But we hope to do it all in a year. So the fun stuff, last time I talked to you, when we went through marketing of Hop, we identified all of the audiences. I actually had a list in front of you, and essentially it's everyone. So with the campaign fully launched on the 17th, we are in full motion forward. We have shipped retail marketing kits, Something like this, this little box showed up at Safeways, Fred Meyers, you name it. In it, there's a stand that goes at the customer service desk to tell people that we're transitioning them to hop. There's information for the retailers. And there's also this little guy, which is a window cling that you'll see in the front glass doors of um, Fred Meyers and Safeways. So a lot of work in the retail packaging, uh, that retail. So right now the cards are at the customer service desks. In September, they'll transition over to the main, um, uh, what is that called, the, the gift card rack at most of those supermarkets. Um, print and transit ads, we'll talk here in a second, and social media as well, our campaign. Earned media, we'll look at various milestones to celebrate and also to get out the word about HOP. Outreach, which is a major component of our campaign. And the TriMet Ticket Office, which we actually gave an informational upgrade um, with our, our HOPsters and our HOP branding. We are doing all of this in three various tranches where we saturate the market with ads. And after Labor Day, uh, we will come together as a team, reassess our messaging, and see if there are any tweaks that we need to make. 
So what we're doing is building awareness around the hop brand and promoting the benefits. It truly is. So you'll see these ads in print, all of the various community newspapers, our transit ads. You'll see a wrapped Max train, various ads on our buses and interior car, our channel cards, digital ads on uh, K2, Coin, and the like. Streaming, we're trying Hulu, YouTube, Pandora, Spotify. So we're really reaching out to those folks who might be um, technologically savvy. Obviously, broadcast and cinema ads, and then also social media ads. And here, let me just show you this little guy because um, we are, this is a 15 second ad. We are actually going with 15 and six second ads. You might think six seconds, what can you actually say in six seconds, but you'd be surprised. In YouTube, that's actually what they recommend. This ad is gonna be on broadcast and it's actually a 15 second. It'll gra it grabs people's attention also because of our colors. So you'll see we've also begun to have a little bit of fun with our marketing campaign with the Hopster, and that's what he's actually known as. Um, and again, the colors, all of the graphics, uh, and the shortness of these commercials grab people's attention in, and it gives us an opportunity to talk with them. Much like what we're doing in social media, completely engaging with folks in social media, obviously touting the benefits. We are promoting the events where we're giving away free hop cards. We're also having contests where people can enter their names for a hop card with actually money on it. Um, all of these give us a chance to talk about the benefits and to engage people one-on-one. -on -one. And so this little guy, again, we're having fun with the, um, the uh, creative that we've, uh, we've developed. And this guy, we actually, it's an animation that we use on Facebook and uh, also in Twitter to just <laughs> to uh, have a little fun and to grab people's attention with it. So outreach is a huge component of our, of our efforts. We have 100 events planned for the Portland metro region where we're talking to people one-on-one. -on -one. We've already done 21 events so far. We have pop-up events scheduled where we're giving away cards at high traffic areas, Gateway Transit Center, Sunset Transit Center, and the like. Um, 150, 500 cards given away, 150 to Hispanic community members. Elders in Action is a huge partner of ours for outreach. We have 20 events planned just with them. We're also looking at our multicultural outreach contractors, bringing on CBOs, community-based organizations, to help us get cards into the community, and distributing also through church networks. So we're using every available option to us. We also are working with Ryan uh, with eight planned ticket exchanges. That means you bring in your tickets, we give you a free hop card, we put the value of those tickets on a card, and you can walk out the door and start using the system. So what are we doing next? Continuing, obviously, we, all of this has just gotten started with the launch, our wide-scale marketing efforts, uh, continuing our outreach events and onboarding even more community-based organizations to help us out and to, to distribute free cards. Obviously, con continue transitioning our monthly pass programs. We're going to shoot for 50 transitions a month. Uh, we'll be promoting the open payments when it launches. We'll also be working on marketing efforts around the Lyft paratransit transition, which will be big. And we'll also be working with John Gardner and his uh, team to develop marketing efforts around our, our HOP low income fare program. So I just wanted to, this is the last slide, and I just wanted to bring you um, to, uh, and show you some of the reaction that we've gotten. And I've actually taken these quotes off of one of our Facebook pages. And, all good stuff, how people are loving the um, hop. And I will say this, it's really fun to see um, our beta testers, our 5,000 beta testers, we have created an army of consumer advocates for us and mm -hmm. they have actually been responding to most of the comments because they're like, oh hey, you need to do it this way or I found it successful this way. So through these little comments, I just wanna point out um, the second from the last, and it says, I have really been liking it. I have caught the Max a few times, and I forgot to scan, but scanning on the bus was super easy. Just so you know, we are aware that we're changing people's habits because now everyone has to tap their card every time they board. So we are looking at ways to remind people to tap, whether it's a decal around the reader, is it a sign on the bus, something to help remind people to tap. And the la finally, the last one, 
Only thing I don't love is I can't use it on the tram. And this just speaks to the convenience people are seeing in the system, in the card, and what we built. And so I think that is a testament to what we have done. Um, I think I also dare say that we've created a monster for ourselves because people will want to use it everywhere else. So I'll gladly take questions. Uh, thank you. Uh, is this all you've been doing? <laughs> <laughs> just a little. Yeah. Hey, uh, JC, I don't know if um, this event has caught your eye. There's a Labor Day picnic. It has between 15 and 18,000 people mm. down at Oaks Park. If you like, I can put you in contact with the people. And Yes, please. I don't know if it's on our list or not, because I, have I haven't been able to keep track of all those, what? but I will definitely uh, I'll reach out to you. Okay, good. Actually, I actually have two questions. Um, first, regarding the free cards and the pop-up events, which I think is a great idea. One of the things that we talked about early on was making, making a certain number of cards available um, for low-income community and coordinating through organizations that serve the low-income community. How have we been doing on that? So we have a, a list of all the cards that we are, are planning to give out. We are planning to give out 200,000 free cards. A good, about 60 to 80,000 of those are meant for employers. So as the employers are transitioned over, they get free cards. But then the remaining bucket of cards are also going to our low-income fair, to our folks who are in transit ac the transit access program, we're also working through those community-based organizations to get cards into um, the communities that really need them. So it's definitely on our list, and there's a, actually we've actually planned out allotments that we are. Okay, so are, are, is it on the to-do list, or are we in process of getting? To we are in process. Group? Okay, so if people have questions on how to get it, who should they contact? They can contact me if they want. Yeah, I'll okay. help. I might, might just add in response to that is that we were in some ways fortunate that we've had our access transit program uh, up and running. So we have these ongoing partnerships mm -hmm. with all of these nonprofit organizations already. So we have the channels, we, have the, we know the people, uh, and we can work to actually uh, access uh, our target market uh, uh, pretty effectively with those partners. And so okay. my, my second question is I have some vague memory as we uh, first started talking about tr uh, transitioning to HOP, about really the, the leading edge nature of this technology, um, and something that we're um, developing far in advance of many of our partners in the industry. Um, and I, I, my memory is that we, we, there was a little bit of discussion, tiny bit, that there might be some opportunity or some interest at some point where we could sell some of this technology to some of our partners. Have, have we looked at that at all, or is that a, possi is that a possibility? Um, I am happy to get more information on it. I don't know right off the top of my head if we're looking at selling it to anybody, but I know there's been interest, uh, at least in the state of Oregon, in joining in partnership and um, being able to share the benefits of the system and um, some operating costs involved. Yeah, it seems like if we can do a little bit of cost recovery and help some of our partners along the way, it'd be kind of nice, so just a thought. I would just note the budding state uh, ODOT transit plan, which is in um, uh, public review right now, does have a policy that sort of in, 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 um, envisions that there is a statewide system for fair payment. So. You could envision this, um, you know, for example, the system in use in other Oregon uh, transit systems. Think Lane, think, you know, uh, uh, Salem, uh, maybe even uh, the Amtrak system. So there are some potential expansions that I think are really exciting in that regard. Um, we are, we do have also a uh, partnership that is starting this year that will expand next, I don't know all the details, but with the uh, bike share system in the city of Portland as well. So uh, the, the goal is to have it to be a ubiquitous uh, transportation related resource. Just a point of clarification, um, I think it can be somewhat confusing prior to the low income fare program that John is going to talk about later. TriMet has provided subsidy yes. for low income, um, and that's what you're implementing 
and you're in the process of implementing now, not to confuse the low-income fare program that's the much larger program. And that's what I was talking about, the much larger. Oh, you were? So yes, so we are actually working through those, those partners currently that we have in the tra transit access program to get cards out to them and we'll be working with them. But on the much larger program, working with John and developing what needs to be done around that. Okay, very good, thank you. Well, I want to say thank you, first of all, for the, uh, for the update. And I also want to commend everybody. I have that written up. <laughs> <laughs> commend everybody on this process for five years to bring in significant things, to make many investments. Uh, so it's, you know, to have it come off uh, the way it has so far, it is tough. Uh, as you know, you, you already referenced it, some of the things, some of the things from the IT perspective that was going on launched this project both uh, statewide and nationally, uh, we were we knew that we were going to move forward with something that could have been brought to Kane Group. We had great leadership and it's, it's actually a little bit unbelievable that we're here today talking about the lot of you. Chris Tucker is not. <laughs> <laughs> Sure. Um, first, thank you for uh, recognizing the hard work, and it's been a pleasure. Um, we can look at adoption rate. I think that is one of our major telling indicators that we will be focusing on over the next few months to see how quickly people are adopting and transitioning from the existing uh, products that they were using. Um, certainly, the comments from the public that we're seeing on Facebook um, and other social media outlets tell us how positive people feel about it and uh, we hope to continue to see those. Um, what other metrics have you? I would also say even just like the calls to the customer, oh, the absolutely. call center, only because, so when we were creating this, and while you think the messages might be simple, that's what we were going for, which, <laughs> which has resonated because there have been very few calls to the call center. And even the website, we worked with Ryan and team and, and Brigade, the contractor, to make it very, uh, the user interface, so it's very intuitive is there, there's always more work to be done around that. But I think that that has helped in all of our marketing materials and how we talk about it. We talk about it in, in very plain, simple English in, in terms uh, to help people understand. And I think that that is very key. So, you know, we'll continue to watch the, the calls that come into our call center and what they're asking, what they're getting hung up on and see if, see if there are ways that we can remedy that. But I think that's definitely a, a huge one. One last one that just came to mind. Uh, the number of registered customers, because I think that not only tells us individuals using our system, but also indivis individuals trusting our system uh, and being willing to put their information out there and associate it um, with our system. So um, we are already, already over 2,000 registered users today. So it's encouraging. Excellent. So again, you know, I want to. <laughs> no, uh, but I do want, I do want to, I just want to make sure that we press upon that idea of making sure that we, you know, as a board, we have an opportunity to hear some of the, some of the metric based I think that we'll be tracking as we go along since this is such a significant investment. We want to make sure that we don't get behind the curve and, and looking at are there things that we need to make sure that we're continuing to invest in and to look at and measure to make sure this is continuing to be a successful rollout. And I like what you already referenced, Ryan, in regards to the adoption rate. I think that's going to be something that's going to be very telling as to the usability of the system and the ease of the system and how seamless it truly is. So again, thank you for everything you said to support John and the entire team for the work that everybody's done. Thank you. One last point. Um, Travis's comment about 
expressing our gratitude and our thanks for all of your hard work, you know, I think is a very, very good one. Um, I'm wondering, um, is there something that we can do as a board to communicate with the entire team um, to express our thanks and appreciation? Because this is a phenomenal job. I've been involved in, in software conversions and I've never had an experience like this. So, um, you know, I do appreciate that hard work. So I think it would be appropriate because of the amount of work and time and effort that our staff has put in on this, I think it should be recognized. Well, why don't we just go on the record to make it very clear that the, the board does appreciate the work of the entire team because I know there was a lot of people in the back rooms doing a lot of work on this to make sure that it was successful. And I'll get together with the general manager and see if there's something we could do on behalf of the board to, uh, to acknowledge and recognize the, the good hard work that was done there. Okay. And I do have one question. What about the tram? <laughs> <laughs> is there a plan there or do you, uh, is, is that? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't. That's I don't. a good answer. I don't. That's a good answer. <laughs> but I, I know that there are people, I mean, I have my transit pass and they do honor the, the monthly transit pass at, the, uh, at, the, at that. But uh, it'll be much more of a challenge, I, I would think now. So I'm just curious what the plan was in the future to deal with that or if not to deal with it. So just let me know. Okay. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. So again, congratulations to all. Uh, we look forward to some uh, more reports on, uh, on adoption and also look forward to hearing how some of our stakeholder groups are, uh, are feeling about the rollout who were concerned about it originally. So again, thanks, thanks to all and, and uh, appreciate the hard work. It was, you guys, you guys obviously put in a lot of effort to make it get to this point. Thank you. Thank you. Good point. Sure, happy to. Good morning, President Warner, members of the board. You may recall last September, you approved the refinancing of the 2011s, the Garvey bonds that we had. Um, and we thought we would be able to take it to market within a matter of months, but the market began to decline. And so we pulled back 
And so we thought, well, let's keep watching the market. Well, waiting paid off because last Thursday, on Neil's birthday, we had a <laughs> phenomenal bond sale. We were we used to had seventy-six million dollars of bonds to sell. Our brokers in New York and San Francisco and other places took orders for all, just under a billion dollars <laughs> on our issue. So it was twelve times oversubscribed, and so the brokers were able to negotiate a phenomenal savings for us. It ended up being about a 7.67% savings in PV savings. And as you may recall, 3% is the threshold for us to actually consider refunding. So it was huge sale from that standpoint. It was about $6.1 million in savings, in PV savings. And that translates to about a million dollars in cash savings, cash flow savings a year. So it was a great day. Happy birthday, Neil. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. I think everybody's just going, yeah. Okay. <laughs> good work. Good work. Yeah. Hi, Peter. This is Brian Barber. Uh, I have great appreciation for the uh, thing that you just stumbled here. I was just going to say, well, it's a matter of business. There's no such big gold uh, uh, process forward. This is really the agents of timing the market in a way that you could be uh, maximizing the success. So, again, great, great effort. Questions? I just have a comment. I don't think you probably wanted to, you didn't touch on it, but I wanted to point out in our packets today was the multi page mini report, uh, a, a, a report on finances and administrative actions for fiscal year 2017, which is required by ORS. Um, and uh, I, I suspect most everybody on the board has read this carefully and understands everything that's in there, but it's pretty darn impressive about what uh, the agency has accomplished over the last fiscal year. And I want to uh, say thanks to you, Mr. General Manager, and to all the staff that work on this. And this, if this isn't available, I know it's available on our website as yes. part of this, this uh, uh, individual meeting, but it may be something you want to post, maybe a part of the accountability uh, 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 web page, just to have people be able to take a look at what, what we've actually been uh, yeah. up to for the last year. And again, as I said, it's pretty impressive and uh, pretty amazing about what uh, what folks have accomplished. So just wanted to note that for the record. Appreciate that. And um, again, we're supported by a, a phenomenal team, as you've have seen a little bit here, and you'll hear even more today. Um, but ag again, it is sometimes a little daunting when you read the full breadth of activities that are going on in this agency. It's a, it, it is a very big program. And we have even more to do in the next year. So we're looking forward to that as well. All right. Moving on then. All right, let's move on then to the consent agenda. And for those watching them here today, items on the consent agenda are considered to be routine and may be approved by the board in a single uh, motion. However, any board member may remove an item from the consent agenda uh, for discussion or questions by requesting so prior to the uh, action uh, uh, for consideration of this portion of the agenda. I will point out uh, for anybody watching this that doesn't have the agenda in front, we have five items on the consent agenda. The first is approval of the board meeting minutes for September 28th, 2017. June. Excuse me, June 28th, thank you, 2017. <laughs> Uh, we also have uh, an, a resolution directing the board of directors that readings of all ordinances be by title only. We have a resolution authorizing contracts with Kelly Services, Lexicon Solutions, Staffing Solutions, and Vanderhoeven Associates for temporary technical staffing services. We have a resolution with Environmental Business Solutions and Rigert Landscaping for vegetated stormwater facility landscape maintenance. Uh, rehabilitation on-call services, and then finally we have a resolution authorizing a contract with Pivot Architecture, uh, Roll Brokaw Architectures, and MCA Architects for design services for building groups, small projects. So, um, first off, is there any item on the agenda that any member of the board would like to have removed for, from the agenda, consent agenda for consideration or questions? <coughs> Seeing that, oh. No, I... I just want to follow up uh, 
on these some questions about these, these resolutions, a couple of them, but not now. Uh, just okay, so that you can take it, you're willing to take action. Small red flags. Okay, so you'd like to, you can take those up with the general manager after we take Oh, them. yeah. Okay, all right, very yeah. good. <laughs> well, then, no, no, and the board. <laughs> okay, all right. You sure you don't want to talk about them now? I'm positive. All right, very good. All right, then, is there is there a motion to approve the consent so agenda? Mr. As President. I hear a motion. Second. I hear a second. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, then let's uh, vote on the motion. All in favor of the motion to approve the consent agenda as presented, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Any abstentions? Motion is approved unanimously. Thank you very much. Uh, did you want to make further comment now or later? Uh, later. Okay, very good. <laughs> let's move on then to resolutions. The first resolution and only resolution we have today is resolution 17. 07-60, which is authorizing a contract with the FFA Architecture and Interiors Inc. for design services for TriMet Central Police uh, uh, Precinct Project. Mr. General Manager. Yeah, Mr. Board President, members of the board, um, in your budget this year, as you know, you approved the funding of a, uh, essentially condominium purchase of a, of a site on the uh, Rose Quarter area. Uh, part of the overall convention center development, and this would be actually a parking garage again developed by what used to be PDC, now Prosper Portland. Um, and again, the basic shell of that structure will be created through that intergovernmental agreement that you approved last April, and again, funded in the budget uh, of this year. Uh, improving that shell to be the final space is really uh, our, our responsibility, and so this procurement is really for those design services associated with filling out the space and designing it. And I would m just note that uh, we are really interested in making this a community-friendly uh, precinct. Uh, so uh, we, we will make it as far away from a jail as it can possibly be. <laughs> um, and I would just want to uh, just note that uh, we've had a good competitive uh, review of this uh, our, our, our uh, response to this RFP for the design services uh, and do recommend FFA architecture and interiors uh, for this, uh, this overall c contract. As you uh, see in your report, we actually had three different uh, firms respond to the RFP. Uh, FFA was rated highest, uh, but again, we had very, very, very good uh, scores in response from both Pivot and McKinsey as well. Uh, I would note that FFA uh, indicated expects to be able to achieve 35% minority uh, owned business enterprise uh, or DBE participation in the project overall. So we're very pleased with that percentage as well. Um, and again, uh, total contract award would be 665,000 and funds were provided in the budget. Um, and we'll obviously update you on the design work as it continues. Um, because I know there was a certain amount of interest both on the board and in the general public for this facility. Uh, I would also note that in addition to the precinct facilities, which will, um, I think, be important for our, our continued presence, um, we also expect that there'll be some community meeting rooms and other things associated with this facility that we'll be able to take advantage of, even as a board meeting venue in the future. Okay. So we're looking forward to all of the uh, uh, improvements that can, uh, can flow from this. So with that, I recommend your approval. Happy to answer any questions. Questions for uh, Mr. General Manager? Seeing none, is there a motion? I'll make a motion. Make a motion. I hear a, a motion to approve uh, resolution 17-07-60. Is there a second? Second. I have a second. Any further discussion on the uh, on the motion? I just, I just think it's great. They hopefully hit 35%. That's. Uh, as Agent Orange says in D.C., that's huge. I agree. I agree. <laughs> Have you got a rooting section out there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. With that comment, is there any further questions or comments? All right, then. All, all those in favor of the motion to approve resolution 17-07-60, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The motion is approved unanimously. Thank you very much. Okay, so now we're going to move on to our ordinance and public hearing. Um, so uh, I, I'd like to ask our general counsel to read this uh, ordinance by title only, please. 
Thank you, Mr. Board President. Ordinance number 346 of the Tri-County Metropolitan Transportation District of Oregon, amending TriMet Code Chapter 28 concerning long-term exclusions from the TriMet system. This is the first reading. Thank you very much. Uh, and before we get started, uh, and, and I'll just open and close the public hearing, did, did I understand there were some maybe su some suggested changes or uh, that we want to make some minor changes to the language as a result of a review? It's yes, I believe Dr. Uh, Director Bauman had okay. a couple of yes. comments. Thank you. Um, yes, I have a few um, um, amendments that I want to suggest that we make by interlineation uh, before we uh, close the public hearing. Um, these are not changes to the substance of the ordinance, but uh, just nailing down some of the details. Uh, and so I, I'll just take a minute and, and uh, describe those to you. Um, on this page two of the uh, Exhibit A, uh, at the top, um, section C, in the second line, there's a reference to TMC 28.18A1. I would like to add uh, uh, the words and subsection two. <clears throat> that just it pulls in um, the fact that uh, one and two there on page on the first page of the uh, exhibit are uh, the exemptions from who may uh, issue the exclusion. Okay. All right. Thank you. Good, good catch. Uh, and then the next, uh, there are two more. Um, same page, paragraph G, the new sentence currently reads, the general manager may waive the 10-day stay should a particular individual pose an immediate and serious threat to the safety of TriMet riders and employees. Um, I, I, my re recommendation would be, and my request would be, to change the word waive to revoke. Um, I think that uh, gives us a little more precision there um, for law nerds out there. Waive means intentional relinquishment of a known right, and I think revoke uh, just fits the, our meaning better. So again, not, not at all to change the substance or the policy, but just for some additional precision. And then paragraph I, the very next paragraph, the same change to the last sentence, change wave to revoke. All right, those seem like uh, very good changes to the ordinance. Um, and I'm just looking at general counsel, that means with these minor changes, we can, with these identified, we can proceed with the uh, the public hearing and the... Yes, uh, you would action. want to make these suggested changes yes. first. So, do we need a motion to make yes. those changes? Okay. I thought she was moving. Did so you I make a motion? Okay. All right, so I have a motion, motion to second. All right, thank you very much. Is uh, are there any discussion on the uh, amendments, Director Prosser? Um, I'm not sure if this is in order right now. It's not on the amendment itself, but it does relate to section G and I, and that is that if I had questions about why we maintain a 10 year, or 10 year, 10 day waiting period in, for these offenses. Um, so that for that 10 days, theoretically, <coughs> someone who by preponderance of evidence has committed very serious crimes can still ride our system. Uh, and I understand that G&I allows the general manager to revoke that, but given the seriousness of the events, why do we have it at all? And, you know, that's a question I have, and I don't know if Neil or, or Shelley would be the ones to respond or... Well, let's see if they can. Okay. <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll take a stab, but I think this is going to need uh, real help. Uh, oh. <laughs> by the way. Um, but I would say what we're doing is we're appending uh, a new authority, which is the authority of the general manager to revoke uh, the 10-day waive to our standard, if you will, procedure. And our, our, our standard procedure is to allow 10 days for particular people who are transit dependent to uh, uh, petition for um, uh, a review of, of their, uh, so if, if it's an individual who has no choice but to use TriMet to get to their daily activities, they can petition to have that uh, 
uh, reviewed. So what we're doing, that's the standard operating procedure, if we will, in all cases. And what we're doing is just, just appending to that this, this uh, remote exception, which I think will be rarely used uh, to, to take away that 10-day waiting period. Um, and so I suspect it's just the form of drafting, the fact that we're appending it to an existing uh, standard operating procedure. Um, and uh, if there's anything else to I add. don't have anything to add to that unless you have further question about it. But yes, sir, uh, what we have now is anybody who's issued an exclusion gets the, that automatic stay. What this is just saying is that the general manager can then decide to revoke that in these circumstances under a preponderance of the evidence standard. Yeah, and I, you know, and I understand that for something as serious as we are talking about, I assume that that stay period would be revoked, you know, given, you know, recent incidents that we have. I'm sorry, we don't want those people on our system. Um, and I understand that the stay is there now for existing exclusions, and, and they're, that's fine. I think we should keep that. It's just in these serious cases, it just, it was a little bit of a mismatch when, when I was reading it. It's okay, this is, is serious. We still allow this 10 day stay unless we take action to revoke it. It, it was a mismatch in my mind, so. So you, if I'm hearing you right, you'd rather say you, you are excluded and, and th if they want to appeal that. They can do it during the exclusion. That's, and you know, I, I, I would prefer Thank that, um, but if, but I think the overall ordinance is important, and I'm supportive of the overall ordinance. I don't want to delay it. Um, so if, you know, folks agree with me, I, I'm, I'm be concerned that that would be a substantive amendment, and I don't want to delay passage. I could live with accepting this yeah. as is, and then come back at a later date. I, I like that. So, yeah, yeah. Well, but I want to raise the issue. Perhaps just a suggestion, and it is a substantive change that would, I think, delay um, the adoption. Um, but we will be doing a much more thorough rewrite of this section of the code associated mm -hmm. with the new legislation that Bernie will report to you on at a later point in time uh, that relates to the citation processing system. So maybe in that context, we can take a sort of a gestalt look at uh, are we treating this in the right way? And, uh, and dive into that question a little bit deeper for you, if that would be acceptable I, as a I, path I, forward. I guess I'd look to the, yeah. to the board. I, oh, sorry, go ahead. My question would concern, first of all, let me say I'm very much in support of doing these long-term exclusions or whatever we can to help promote the safety for all of our riders. But I'm also concerned that even those who fit this category still have their rights, which is a right to appeal. Mm -hmm. What I'm understanding is that the person, wherever, whomever, has a right to appeal within a 10-day window. Mm -hmm. I think if we, again, just posing the question, if we say you just don't have that 10-day, are we being fair and legal to take away their appeal process when we can balance that by saying the general manager due to the preponderance of the evidence can revoke it. So you have a right to appeal. We did not take away any of your rights. I can see a fight coming off of that. But then saying that, okay, you have a right to, but due to the preponderance of the evidence of what has happened, you do not have a 10-day period to uh, appeal. It is therefore revoked, and this goes in effect now. But if I could perhaps ask Shelley to respond to that, um, just to sort of clarify how all that works. Right. So, so what we're talking about on the 10-day the notice is only the 10 days. You're right. That this individual would still have the right to a review, to appeal the exclusion. And the, and the period of time of the exclusion. So those rights are not, those don't go away. But this is really about that balance between safety, public interest safety, versus a violent offender on our system who, like the May incident, the, the facts uh, are, are clear enough for the general manager to make a determination 
that an individual like that would not be able to ride for the next 10 days. That doesn't mean they couldn't still appeal their exclusion, but they couldn't ride for the 10 day period until they could have a hearing. Okay, and to clarify where I'm coming from, I would not want to take their right to appeal away. Yeah. So. And, and this does not. Okay, all right. Any other questions? Well, so yes, so procedurally the next thing to do is you would make a motion, which you did and seconded, to, to have these changes made, but <laughs> Gwen just pointed out that if we're gonna make the change up there at the top of the ordinance to sec subsection C, where it says 2818A1 and 2, mm -hmm. we need to also make it down below, same page, subsection mm -hmm. O1, well, O, excuse me, right there at the beginning, where it also cites TMC 2818A1 and 2 on the line. So we'd probably have to do another motion to Is that, that a friendly in. amendment to All your right. motion? Yes, I, I amend the motion to add uh, the phrase and subsection two to uh, paragraph O. Okay, is that? Uh, Continue the, with the second. Yeah, on, uh, yeah. On, oh, no, oh, yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah, continue with the second. Right. So we'll consider those friendly amendments and we'll, we'll continue on. So uh, later, I think we have the same situation on four. On the, on the next page, on the third page, uh, TMC 28.18A1. It's the same, we may have the same situation there. I, you, you do, now that I've just read that. So why don't we do a friendly amendment that says any place within this <laughs> ordinance where that applies, meaning the addition of subsection two, We'll do that. We'll make that interlineation to make sure it's consistent throughout. Okay. Consistent throughout the document. Consistent throughout the document. Yes. All right. All right. Good. All right. So still have a motion and a, and a second to make the changes with the additional changes to, to be consistent throughout the uh, ordinance. Uh, see no further discussion. All those in favor of the motion to amend uh, this ordinance, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? That motion is, is approved. So before we uh, take uh, uh, extent, extent, uh, stop our action this morning, since this is the first reading, I think I'm going to open the public hearing now on ordinance number 346 to see if there's anybody in the audience who didn't testify earlier on this that would like to testify on this ordinance at this time. Is there anybody who would like to speak uh, to the, uh, or this ordinance? Seeing none, I'm going to close the public hearing then. So from our standpoint, uh, do we need to do any further actions on this ordinance at this time? Not at this time, unless the, if anyone has any questions right. about the ordinance, wants to have any discussion. Okay. The only question I have is, um, how do we enforce what we have right now, and how, you know, what, what steps do we take to enforce this, since our system is an open system? Um, it basically, we can actually have uh, Commander Westbrook and Harry Supporter will be giving your uh, report on crime statistics, I might want them to respond, but uh, a little bit more detail, but fundamentally it's through our fair inspection program um, or our patrols of our police officers uh, of the system who really enforce that, uh, that exclusion over time. Uh, so, you know, I'll say that I am very supportive of the ordinance that we're discussing right now, because frankly, you know, we do have some challenges where the current ordinance does not address uh, egregious situations where we could have some significant challenges uh, with safety. And so we, continue, we need to continue to move forward with our safety efforts. As I read through this, uh, the, the, the two words that jump out at me consistently are general manager. Uh, that kind of, and, uh, and of course, that's throughout the, the changes that we've made. And sometimes when you see something like this or a change to an ordinance, uh, or policy, you sometimes say, okay, what, what are some of the checks and balances that we now have in place going forward? I mean, because this is potentially a long-term exclusion on the shoulders of the general manager. We've got the ability to appeal, uh, and that's something that I think that Dr. Bethel has already referenced, something that has to uh, be available to folks that experience this type of situation. But even in the, uh, in the initial exclusion, uh, before it even gets to appeal, uh, and you know, as, you, as, you, as you're looking through an ordinance like this and the changes and you're trying to kind of step through methodically, if this happens and X happens, then Y is the uh, outcome. 
Um, what are some of the things that uh, you know we'll have in place uh, specifically as we go forward? I mean, we uh, as we look at the, the current general manager, you know, we like him, so <laughs> we're, we're, we're keeping him. Uh, so, but you know, we've got a lot of confidence there. Not to say that in the future we wouldn't, but that's always somewhat of a concern. You know, whenever there's a change that may happen in the distant, distant future, then uh, you you don't know what may may come in the future. And so, trust is a big thing that we have in this in this situation. Are there any things uh, that we can, you know, as a board, we can have the confidence that uh, these changes actually address that ability to not have a general manager's opportunity to exclude in situations that are less egregious than we're seeing here. Well, I may ask the general counsel to respond as well, but one other thing I, I would note that we, we currently, uh, this is really the same procedures in a very large extent that we have right now, and I do see on a pretty regular basis, as a matter of fact, Gwen helps me on a regular basis with these, is uh, appeals to various exclusions. Yeah, we're, we always look at the circumstances that the individuals involved. So, for example, perhaps there was a substance abuse issue and the person was getting professional uh, help uh, on that, then generally we're pretty, um, uh, frankly, lenient about restoring uh, access to the system, particularly if it's important for that person to get to medical appointments or treatment options. Um, but again, if there are, there's violence uh, that occurred related to the exclusion, it's a very different standard um, to sort of uh, reward. So uh, we have an exclusion administrator who people administers the appeals. When we get the appeals, they, uh, they come to our office and we, uh, we do, frankly, a judgment on each of these cases uh, about really the fundamental um, concern we have is keeping our employees and our riders safe and making sure that we uh, we respond to that. Um, I'll, I'll also just note that we do have a hearings officer process as well. So, uh, uh, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. I would just add that as for safeguards built into the ordinance itself, built into the whole process itself, and and specifically to the changes that we're suggesting, it's the it's the nature of the offense itself that we're talking about. It, it's mm -hmm. a serious physical uh, uh, offense against a person. Those are the o that's the only universe that we're talking about having these longer exclusions for. So that's the first thing. And the second thing would be the rarity <laughs> of those types of offenses. Mm -hmm. I think you're gonna hear from Harry uh, in a few minutes about you know, 99 million boardings last year and a couple hundred offenses against persons and even of those, and even small. So we're talking about fractions of 1%. And, you know, so you've, you've now got a very narrow universe that's made even more narrow by how many actual incidents happen on our system. And then, as Neil said, you've got, you've got the appeal process built in, in which someone who was excluded for longer than a year would have that right every year to come back and say, I, I have new circumstances to present to you, or I have reformed, or, yeah, and so even a lifetime exclusion could, over time, be changed again. Those are, th those are the safeguards that immediately come to mind. Thank you. Thank um, you. I just say, obviously, I, I think this is a, a good move to help ensure the safety, of, as you said, of our, of our drivers, operators, as well as our riders and the general public. Uh, I think it's a, it's a tool that we need to have. So uh, I'm comfortable with this. For the people watching uh, uh, online or at the meeting here today, this is our first reading. Uh, we've had our public hearing, and we now have to wait till our next business meeting, which is on August 9th, 9th where this ordinance uh, can be approved and then go into effect 30 days after uh, its approval by the board. So that's kind of the general timeline. So this will be coming back to the board for its blessing or uh, revisions at our next uh, normal business meeting at which time I'm hoping we can take action on this and move forward. All right? Very good. All right, that concludes our discussion on this ordinance today. I'm looking at our, uh, our uh, agenda. I see no other uh, business items Could coming before the board reading? this morning. Is there anything that the, the board is aware of that needs to come to, the, uh, to our attention for consideration this morning? Or shall I adjourn the meeting? All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna adjourn our, our business meeting today, and we'll move into our our briefing agenda here, which will start.
Uh, I guess I'm looking at the board. Do we need a, a break? Okay, so five minutes, is that much? Okay, five minute break, and we'll come back and get into the briefings. Thank you, everybody.
General Manager, are you ready to go? Yeah. We're ready to go. Ready, ready to go. Why don't we get started again? Uh, and uh, do you want to introduce the uh, next item, Mr. General Manager? I'd be, I'd be very happy to, uh, Mr. Board President, members of the board, we're pleased to have here our uh, Director of Safety and Security, Harry Saporta, and our Commander of the Transit Police Division, Sarah Westbrook. Welcome both um, to give us a report on uh, crime on the system uh, for uh, last year. So uh, I would just note, at, uh, as Harry will cover, this is actually a new way of reporting information. And so some new terms and some new uh, gauges for us to get uh, familiar with. So I was just going to jump in real quick and answer the question that you had about how we would respond if there was someone uh, who was revoked uh, immediately and and excluded for an extended period of time. Uh, it would be a very small number of people and we would know who they were and we would communicate that out. We would probably have a picture of the person, uh, give that out to the fair inspectors or other supervisors. All the transit police officers would know who the person was and we would be actively, as opposed to a passively, watching for that person and doing whatever we could to make sure that they were not on the system. So uh, this morning we would like to give you an overview of the um, of our security report and uh, crime report. And in your packet, you actually have the crime report itself. Um, this is the detailed report, and I want to emphasize we're only providing an overview. So if there's anything that you uh, may have questions about, please uh, don't hesitate to ask. Prior to 2016, we were using the Uniform Crime Reporting System, and that is an event-based uh, process. Um, the FBI had been working on an alternate system called NIBRS, or the National Incident-Based Reporting System, which is really an offense-based system, and which that means is that when there is a particular event that takes place, uh, each offense associated with that particular event is recorded. So for example, uh, if there was an individual who was brandishing a handgun and was uh, confronting two individuals, that would be considered an aggravated assault and that would be two offenses, not just a single event. So under the UCR, or Uniform Crime Reporting System, it was all, always reported as a single event, regardless of the number of individuals re involved, regardless of the other offenses that might be associated with that particular event. Under NIBRS, every single one of those offenses are now captured. So that is a um, large departure <coughs> from how we reported incidents in the past. Is, um, are all crime reporting agencies now using this new system? So Portland and Lake Oswego and Gresham and everybody? So the answer is, in this region, the answer is yes. Okay. Um, this is a national program that the FBI has been undertaking for several years. Um, it took us a while to really understand the system uh, everyone is to be in compliance by 2021. Okay. So TriMet decided in 2016 to do this, to start the effort. And uh, quite frankly, I'm glad that we did because um, it was a uh, quite a bit of a large undertaking. We initially started with a <coughs> dual reporting system in, very early in that year, and we found that it was just too difficult to keep um, straight each one of those things. So we, we just said, we're just gonna to move to the NIBRS system and do that. So what that really means now is that you really can't think of the numbers that you're going to see this morning as single events. There are, there are multiple events, offenses. So um, there may be an individual, again, I wanna repeat myself. There may be an event that has multiple offenses involved. So you can be charged with assault and you can be charged with intimidation. So those are two offenses. It may only have been one event. 
So I think that's very important as we go through this. Very real quick question. With the new system, are we gonna have problems kind of looking at our past history and trends as a result of this change? We cannot make the comparison to the previous years between the NIBRS and the UCR systems. But once we begin to collect information under NIBRS, we will be able to, collect, to make comparisons from year to year. It's just that we cannot make that comparison from 2016 to 2015. We do believe, however, through situational awareness that if we were to make a comparison, just because of our knowledge, and I asked uh, our police officers and, um, and others uh, that are involved in, in uh, monitoring um, the types of crimes, what they believed. Did they believe that there was an increase in crime for 2016 compared to 2015, or did they believe it was flat, or was there a decrease? For the most part, everyone felt it was relatively flat. Now, I'm saying relative because I don't have a specific way to, to say that exactly. However, what we will be doing is that we will be comparing about the first quarter of 2016 to the first quarter of 2015, or uh, I'm sorry, yes, to 2015. No, 17 and 16. 17 to 16, I'm sorry, yes. <laughs> see, I get mixed up too. <laughs> 2017 to 2016 to see what is the trending. So we're not gonna wait for the full year to see the trend. We will begin that analysis now. Okay, thanks. Okay. So with that, um, uh, Commander Westbrook is going to walk you through the, the actual stati statistics themselves. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So I'm happy to report that uh, of almost 100 million rides, uh, we had 1,247 offenses that occurred uh, in, the, in the system as a whole in 2016. Now, just to, and it's in your booklet, but just to make sure you understand how we, uh, how NIBRS works, see if I can do this from memory, uh, there's, first you decide it's a crime against a person or property and then the category is, there's different categories within there, you know, and those are listed on page two, arson, assault, bribery, burglary, so there's, there's different categories, and then underneath that, there's different uh, types. So there's, um, under assault, there's the types of simple assault, aggravated assault, and intimidation. So th that's how far it breaks it down, which is helpful to us because it gives that level of detail where the old, system did not. So in, uh, in 2016, we had 1,247 overall offenses. And you can see in this uh, pie chart here that the majority of those are property offenses, the vast majority. And then we have 23% uh, being person and 19% being society. There's always a question about what is a society offense. And that means that it's, there's no specific person who's the victim. For instance, drunk driving uh, would be a society offense. Um, drugs, uh, uh, somebody having to be in possession of drugs or selling drugs is a society offense. There's no buddy that the DA would bring in and say, here's the victim of this crime. Society as a whole, or our ridership, our mobile community is the victim of that offense. If there's any questions as we go, feel free to jump in. So, where did these offenses take place? Uh, the majority of them occurred on the rail. We have uh, the next one being um, buses and then off system. Off system is going to be all the other things that the, the property that TriMet owns, the business offices, uh, there's just different locations, overpasses, uh, the right of way that are not technically uh, on a bus or on the rail. The next uh, breakdown is our customers. So, let's see. Person and property offenses against customers, we had a total of 733. The vast majority of those, again, are larceny. And I want to uh, remind you that it's considered larceny if you leave your item on the train or bus, and then at the end of the day, you go back to lost and found, and it's not there that gets reported as a larceny. Okay. So 
so they're not necessarily that hey while you were riding somebody um, just took your stuff while you weren't looking it could have been after you left the bus and it, it happens more often than I had realized uh, we're very concerned about uh, person crimes against customers so most of them are simple assaults and the simpler assault, there's no weapon involved, and the level of physical injury uh, to the person, to, uh, the victim of the crime, is low. But those were the vast majority of the person crimes against our customers. And then it's you know, split, really, between intimidation and aggravated assault. And remember, aggravated assault is when uh, usually there's a, a weapon involved or a significant injury. Intimidation is, is not, uh, these aren't necessarily crimes by Oregon state uh, statutes. The, remember, these are the overall what the, they're using general terms so that across the country, everybody's state laws can fit into one of these uh, categories. So we don't have the crime, you know, our, our crime of intimidation is not what we mean here. This is inclusive of, of people, um, um, threatening someone or just getting uh, behaving in a way that is they're not actually touching them but um, or it's such a minor touch that it doesn't rise to the level of an assault well I jumped ahead of myself because this slide is when I was going to tell you that a lot of these uh, property crimes um, probably half were people leaving their items on a bus or train and then finding that it was gone. On occasion, we do have people who repetitively lose their things on buses and, and trains, uh, which we find interesting and I raise my eyebrow a little. Um, employees, this is uh, crimes against our employees is clearly it's a national topic and it's of a deep concern to us. It's one of the uh, primary primary pushes that I have as a transit police commander to make sure that we are responding and investigating each uh, allegation of a crime against an employee. The, and the vast majority of these are person crimes. Uh, the Let's go to the next one. The person crimes fall within these three categories. So it's simple assault. Uh, it, most of them, and I've said a couple times now what simple assault is described, how that is described, in intimidation and aggravated assault. Uh, we had five. Uh, we do, uh, these are high priority for us and we're, they get assigned out for thorough investigation. We're pulling the video, same with, with, with the customer, crimes against customers. Th those are high priority for us to follow up on and see and if we can notice patterns and make sure that we're holding people accountable for their behavior if we're able to identify them. And then we, just to get a little bit more into uh, the details, rail operators, uh, the person crimes against rail operators is only four and the bus operators 33 and I think that's uh, clear as to why the rail operators are in a enclosed compartment and uh, unless they happen to come out for some reason, they are protected in a way that our bus operators are not. And the other part about that is the bus operators, you know, have a, an interaction with everyone who boards the bus. And so that just uh, can create a situation where the, an event happens that's um, violent. I can, excuse me, yeah, please. You said I could ask questions? Yeah. No comment. Are, are there other places in the country, other agencies that have uh, off-the-shelf systems to protect the bus operators? We're going to talk about that at the end. That'll be Director Supporters. Uh, but yes, we, there's some ideas that we're, okay. we're moving towards. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. If you're Thank referring to a protective barrier, the answer is yes. Okay. And mm -hmm. there are several types out there. Uh, this is just a heat map. Uh, sometimes it's helpful visually to see where the event is occurring 
and this one details out the what what lines, bus lines, and then geographically where in the city, and and where you where the blob, the color blob is, is where the concentration of the events happen. Um, these statistics are really helpful for us to give us information on where we should be pointing our uh, efforts, uh, where we should, you know, for as the police officers of the transit police so that we can get out there and make sure that we're present in these areas specifically. And I think this is now a good segue into go into, you know, what are we doing to address the issue of assaults against employees? Well, there are a number of things that are underway. And in 2016, in fact, uh, we started just about a year ago, July of 2016, something called a Security Continuous Improvement Team. This group is comprised of bus operators, supervisors, and trainers. Um, Commander Westbrook is also a member of the team, uh, as our district attorney is. Uh, the district attorney assigned to TriMet uh, and other security personnel. And I personally lead this particular group. Um, it's actually very important to me. One of the things that we have been able to accomplish is to identify an assault prevention awareness training program that is offered by the National Transit Institute. Uh, so starting in uh, 20, late in the fall of 2016, we instituted this program and trained every single bus operator and bus supervisor assigned um, to the bus divisions. And um, they, they, uh, we got excellent feedback from them saying that they found this to be extremely helpful. Um, one of the other things the group did was also to look at the fare collection procedures. We gained their input and we modified the standard operating procedures as to how they go about collecting fares. And we wanted to move away from them being an enforcer to one of being an informer. And that's pretty significant because what we didn't want was we wanted the situations to be de-escalated. We did not want them to be in a, involved in a confrontation. If it did begin to escalate, that's when supervisors or transit police would then uh, become involved depending upon the circumstances uh, of the situation. Um, the question was asked about a uh, vehicle protective barrier. And in this particular slide, you'll see there is a barrier. Uh, this photo is actually from Coast Mountain in uh, Vancouver, BC. Um, it is uh, manufactured by AeroGuard. This is the same barrier that we are considering. The question is why this barrier? What makes this one unique? I think it makes it unique in a couple of di different ways. One is that it does um, have a sliding window, so if there is a driver or an operator who wishes not to be fully protected, and I would say it's not a full protection, it, it's a, it protects you about seven-eighths of the way, um, and I'll explain why in a minute. Um, they can slide the window depending upon um, whether they wanted the protection or not. Um, one of the things that the operator said very clearly from the beginning, please do not put me in a cage. So there are, there are barriers out there or protective systems that literally do that. It's a full enclosure and the operator is isolated from the customer and uh, the group felt that this was not something that they wanted to see. They wanted that interaction. And I have to say, I think that with these barriers, even with these barriers in place, some of the customers have remarked that, and we have been doing surveys, have remarked that, um, you know, why are there, is there a barrier? And I feel like there's this disconnect. We don't want to be disconnected. So that's why we're, we're not advocating the use of a full protective barrier. We also looked at making a revision to the current Oregon statute regarding uh, assaults on operators. And um, we wanted to escalate the penalty from a misdemeanor to a felony. It is a felony under certain, cer certain circumstances, but we wanted to uh, elevate it even more so and broaden the scope of it. Unfortunately, we were not successful in that arena, but that doesn't mean we're gonna give up. So I've already been in contact with others to see what 
do we need to do to change this? And we will, with the next legislative session, uh, take another crack at this. One of the other elements that we're looking at is post-incident counseling and support. Um, there's more work to be done in this particular area. Um, this discussion is ongoing. We're just not sure where it's going to go just yet, but this is why we need the operator's input. We want to know what do they need to feel supportive, supported when, they're, when they are involved in an assault situation. Looking at the technology, and we are making some significant upgrades to the CCTV system within buses and eventually trains. Um, this is an ongoing project. Uh, we hope to have it fully completed with all the buses about mid-year of 2018. So some of the, you, uh, yes. Is, has that proven to be a good deterrent overall? I would not put that in the category of a deterrent. Um, I, I don't think that the perpetrator necessarily looks around to see is there a camera looking at me. So I wouldn't say that necessarily. But we do use it highly, you know, very extensively. It's proven to be a um, extremely beneficial in identifying perpetrators and that result in their identification and their arrest okay. and conviction. Good. Yeah. Thank you. We have a fairly high rate of conviction too. Um, in ident you know, first it's the challenge is to identify the individual, and uh, uh, but we're pretty successful in doing that as well. So, one of the goals is to ensure not only you know the operator's safety, but then also give the our customers confidence that when they ride, that they will be safe as well. We believe that um, in order to do that, there needs to be a high level of security presence. And we achieve that through a couple of different ways. One is transit police, the other is uh, security officers and obviously the TriMet supervisors that um, serve the rail lines and the bus lines and, uh, and they do ride on occasion as well as they're at stations and other uh, locations. One of the things that did happen post the very tragic event in May, on May 26th, is that we did increase we, uh, the number of security officers. So we nearly doubled those. And, um, and that continues today. We have not backed off from that. Uh, we will be looking at this after a few months to see its level of effectiveness and whether or not we uh, need to continue or do something a little different. During that time, we also enhanced the transit police patrols. Um, fortunately, a number of our transit police partners um, helped us in that regard, and they provided us with additional police officers. Although not permanently assigned to the transit police unit, they did help supplement our patrols. We also believe that education is very key to this. Um, there's a role we all play. TriMet plays a role and I believe the public has a role is in this as well. And that is to be aware of their surroundings and then to protect their things. And um, we have several means of uh, achieving this. One is that we do get invited to neighborhood association meetings. Uh, the commander and I have done that uh, several times uh, this year and have done that last year as well. Um, we have uh, printed materials on how to protect your belongings, and then there's information on our, on our website as well. There is an issue with, even though we didn't go into motor vehicle theft um, in the presentation, and it is in your uh, crime report, um, auto theft does occur. And, um, but it's also responsibility to make sure that the, that the motorist locks their car and that's you know pretty important and keeps those high value things out of sight and locked up in their trunk or not even bring them along at, at all. There's another program that we have that we um, have partnered with the Mayor's Office of Youth Violence Prevention and it's called the Street Level Outreach Team. And TriMet has contracted for two of these individuals but when we do that we're actually contracting 
with all of the others because they do work in groups. And we've, we believe this to be a very effective program. And their primary um, role is to engage with youth and to, um, sometimes we hear that uh, the youth get rambunctious or um, very boisterous. Um, it's to help keep it tamped down a little bit and, and have writers feel comfortable. And then obviously, key to this also is the, a comprehensive analysis. And moving to NIBRS now helps us do that. It enables us to really look at the data in greater detail and be a lot smarter on how we um, make our deployments. And it also helps us evaluate our strategies. Are they effective or do we need to do something a little bit different? And the heat map that you saw earlier is an example of one of the tools that we use to do that. Um, and there were you know, a couple of surprises that we saw and we've made some adjustments to that area. Maybe it wouldn't have been a surprise to the, uh, to the transit officer that was working uh, those particular geographical areas, but when we looked at the data as a whole, there were a couple of things that stood out for us. So what are we doing? Where are we moving? Obviously, we want to continue the security CIT. We think this has a, a been a very effective program. The operator's input has been invaluable in helping us address the whole assault issue. We also want to expand that training that we offer to the bus operators and supervisors. And now we're going to move this into the rail operations side of the house and others. Um, we are installing protective barriers. Uh, we have three prototypes in play right now. Just this week, we're adding a three additional ones. The ones that we're adding, <coughs> we have modified. It was based upon the previous version and the operator inputs. Again, we want the operator to feel that this is something that is uh, a tool and is not uh, burdensome to them. We want to look at increasing security presence. And uh, as I stated, that we did increase the number of security personnel. We have not increased the number of police officers, but we have increased the number of security personnel. And for the time being, those are in place and we will be evaluating that effectiveness. Um, we need to continue the education program. So we are continu continuing, continuing, <laughs> excuse me, with that messaging. And then, as I stated earlier also, it's upgrading that video camera uh, system. Um, although it's not a strong deterrent uh, in the buses, um, we still believe that it is an invaluable tool and we need to continue using it. So with that, I'm sure you may have additional questions and we'd be pleased to answer those. Another comment, please. <laughs> Your rooting section's still out there, too. <laughs> you know, I see the press, the fourth estate here. Um, I wonder if we can get something, some type of messaging along your presentation as a public service announcement on, on the stations here, in, yeah, on the KV stations, what we're doing, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you know, the, the officer and maybe yourself. Something to say, what's TriMet doing, and here's what's go is going to be happening, you know, slowly or, fi or, or quickly. So um, we can, no offense to anybody, but how many people read the, the board notes? <laughs> you know, uh, it's just the way it is, but they do watch television, and I'm sure, of course, the, the social media, which I have ignored very faithfully, <laughs> uh, but it's just the way it is. But I just thought about that. Here's an idea. Good point. You indicated, here, you indicated, Harry, that there were some things that were a, a surprise to you. Would you elaborate on that, please? Sure. Um, so one area was in looking at the data of, uh, regarding motor vehicle theft. Um, so in your in your in the crime report. Um, I don't recall which page it is. There's a breakdown of the number of motor vehicle thefts by um, park and ride facility. And it also shows the level of annual usage of each. And when you look at it at, at a rate 
basis, that was what was a surprise to me. So we even asked our own police officers, which area has the highest number of, of auto theft? No surprise, it's Gateway. Now why Gateway? It has a lot of autos there. So, you know, wherever you have a, a lot of something, um, that's, you know, when you have a lot of people <coughs> congregate in one area, usually you have more crime in that particular area. Well, the same thing with auto theft. But if you look at it at a, at a rate, Holgate jumped out. And we said, oh, maybe we need to make an adjustment. We do provide security patrols in the Gateway area. And the other area that is um, a large park and ride facility is, is Sunset Transit Center. So we said, nope, we need to look at Holgate a little bit more closely. So that's an adjustment we made. Um, the other one was the Beaverton Transit Center. So when we were looking at the customer-related uh, offenses we said, and looked at that, said, oh, we didn't realize. But then when we spoke to our West Side precinct, they said, oh, no surprise. So it was a little bit of a surprise to me, but not to our officers. Mm -hmm. Thank, you. Thank you for the report. Uh, it, it's, you know, it's evident that uh, you know, the work that we do leads us to a situation where we have a, a low, low, low crime rate in comparison to the number of rides that we give in a year that's almost 100 million. Uh, that, uh, I think that comes out to about 300,000 people a day. Uh, that's uh, almost, uh, almost three Greshams. I <laughs> tend to count everything in how many Greshams. <laughs> so, three Greshams, by the way. Uh, now, Harry, you referenced that uh, the comparison of year over year is not available at this point since we've made, to, uh, made this change uh, to this new uh, platform. But as we look at that, so I just want to be clear on the, what we're looking at now. The way we're doing it now actually would present or give us more incidences than we would have seen historically. Is that a correct reflection? No. I see a lot of heads nodding. <laughs> no. That's why no. I just said not, 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 no. not more incidences. So it's <laughs> not individual events. So the, these are the number of offenses. So I think that's the important distinction that we need to make. So if, we, if it was incident-based, we would be able to look at the previous years. But it, it's offense-based. It just it depends <laughs> what kind of language you're using. Correct. So incident is... is you, know, you go and one thing happened, but multiple offenses can occur within one incident, mm -hmm. or just one offense could occur within one incident. And that's why you don't know. So when you count offenses, it is, m there could be multiple offenses within one incident or event, as Harry says. So then historically, we basically counted incidences. Correct. And now we're counting offenses. And the problem with doing that in the previous system is that we always looked at the most serious offense and counted that only, not recognizing mm -hmm. all of mm -hmm. the other offenses that may have occurred. So there was a, a hierarchy of offenses <laughs> within <laughs> each incident. So we would have more offenses. So, you know, with more I, offenses, <laughs> yes, uh, but I understand, I understand that perspective. But as we look at that, how many offenses are going to be situated in a situation where we've got uh, let's say a auto theft. I mean, are we, is that multiple offenses? Is that for the most part a single offense? That, that's a single offense because you can't have multiple offenses. Correct. <laughs> so then as we're looking at the data, <coughs> you're going to say something. I, I, just so you, let's say not only did I steal your auto, but I punched you in the nose. Now we Correct. Have to. But that's, if there's, I mean, if there's nobody around, right. I mean, so what I'm trying to gauge is, is we, we talk about the inability to compare the numbers, which I can appreciate. And ultimately, the comparison is really just a way for us to measure whether or not crime has decreased or increased. So it's really not, I mean, it's, it's not affecting or impacting safety per se. You know, it's not impacting the way we do our job just because of the way we're counting it. So it's not, it's not to say whether we're less safe or more safe uh, in the comparison concept, uh, but it does give us the ability to compare it. Now, if we're, if, if we're seeing it rise, then yeah, we're, we're, we're not as effective in holding down crime. Uh, so all I'm saying there is, is that the ability to compare is beneficial, but it's primarily beneficial for us to know what the trend is. Mm -hmm. But as I look at, and I, as I begin to think through this, it, it would, and I'm, I'm, I'm making an assumption here in this comment, but it would seem that 
the primary area where, where we would have multiple offenses is crimes against a person. Yes. I mean, because some of the other, the larceny, uh, yeah, I could punch you, but, you know, there's going to, yeah, if I'm, if I'm picking up somebody's phone that they left, yeah, it's, that's the larceny part. Right. Uh, so it's going to be really that crimes against a person. So I'm, as I'm looking at this information, I've got prior reports, and I'm not going to do the comparisons because I know I'm, I'm, I'm not skilled enough to do that and don't have enough information. But really, it's that crime against a person that's really going to see some type of, of escalation, per se, going from incidences to offenses. Right. Absolutely true. So we will be monitoring that in future years. Mm -hmm. If we see the number of assaults going up, that's going to be a concern, and that's what we will address. I mean, you know, with some of the property one, with the property ones, similarly, if we see a lot of auto thefts going, you know, that trending going up, yes, we will, you know, address those particular issues. It's just that I, we didn't want anyone to think that when you looked at the overall numbers of offenses that all of, oh, geez, you know, we tripled the number of, of uh, we tripled the amount of crime on, on the system. That's not accurate. Mm -hmm. We can't say that. But we can make those categorical um, uh, uh, comparisons in the future years. Okay. The, the, the so, so let me take this just one step further. So you might be asking the question, well, why couldn't we look at assaults and compare it to last year? It's because of the way things are captured. So let me give you uh, an example. You may have had a robbery. Now last year, under this UCR system, robbery was considered person crime. Robbery now is considered property crime. With a robbery, if, you, if the individual was assaulted as well, harmed in any way, or there was a gun brandished at the time, we now have two offenses. So when we look at last year's data <coughs> and look at robbery, we don't know if whether or not there was an assault, but now we're counting the assault. So if you only look at the assaults, trying to make a, the comparison, you can't make that comparison from year to year. We will in the future. Mm -hmm. We just can't go backwards. We've tried. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, we really did try. Mm -hmm. We had crime an analysts try. <laughs> All right, thank you. With this last discussion, one of the things that occurred to me, are there offenses within this list of Group A offenses that will always go, or prime, predominantly will go, in tandem with another offense. Oh. And so, and as I look at this list, for example, would a sex offense almost always include an, an assault? You know, and- I would, and, my guess is yes, but I don't know. I mean, yeah. kidnapping, I don't know how you would do that without an assault at the same, well, I suppose it's possible, but. It's so, probable that there'd yeah. be a connection there. Yeah, so some of the things that we account, counted as one, like a kidnapping or a sex offense, mm -hmm. now may automatically become two offenses. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, I'm just, I'm trying to get my mind how this, around how I this understand. new system works. So. <laughs> the, you know, that, that was one of the reasons why it took us this long to present the data. It yeah. really took us a long time to understand the new system. Mm -hmm. The more you scratch at it, yeah. the more complex it gets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we also think it can be very powerful because now we have a lot more information. Mm -hmm. So I guess I want to say thank you first off for the information. Uh, again, for anybody watching, we're here today. I want to make it clear that safety and, pro and, and security is, is a priority for this board. And we've been working at this for some time. And I, it, it, it's frustrating we can't go back and compare where we are today to where we are you know, last year as an example. My belief is we're better, because I look at the trends that we've had that we continue to be safer. And, and I think most important to that also is people's perception of safety. And I know that we do, every year or every other year, we do a, a 
you know, surveys of our riders to just see if they feel safe. And overwhelmingly, our riders believe that it's a safe system. And I think the statistics, just to reiterate what uh, Director Stovall said and what I think you tried to say, Mr. Mr. General Counsel, mm -hmm. is that with 100 million rides a year and with 1,200, you know, offenses, if you look at that, I did the math, I'm an engineer, I like math, <laughs> that, that's essentially less than one chance in 100,000 rides of, of being involved with some sort of crime. And the vast majority of those crimes are, are property offenses. And what I learned today, which is interesting, is the people leaving things behind on the buses are counted as a, uh, 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 if it, it doesn't show up in the loss of found, or, or, or classified as, as a uh, property offense. So I think we're gonna learn some more tonight, so I'm actually quite pleased about the transition to getting some more detailed data because that's what this board wants. We want some inform we want us to report how we're doing. We, we want us to compare us against other organizations in terms of how we're doing because we want to be the best we can be in, in, uh, in safety and security. So thank you for your efforts and I will, I'm looking forward to working with all of you in the future as we continue our quest to continue to move those numbers down, uh, which I think we've been successful in doing in the last few years. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. All right. Uh, Mr. General Manager, you have a legislative update for us? Yes, I'd like to invite uh, Aaron Dees and Bernie Bonnemley to come forward, please. Um, and um, first of all, I just want to acknowledge the great, great work that Aaron did for us uh, in Salem on a regular basis. Obviously, a really an incredibly successful legislative session for transportation and, and transit in particular, but TriMet in particular. And I think uh, to a large extent, um, many of the good works of this board and the rest of the staff uh, got to be represented by Mr. Dees down in, in Salem, but he was ubiquitous down there uh, and everybody knew where to go to get uh, a, a TriMet related answer. and. Um, and and uh, thanks to all the good work of everyone, those were positive answers, a good story that we could tell. So let me turn it over to you, Bernie, um, and uh, hear what happened. Thank you, Mr. General Manager, uh, Board President Warner and others. Uh, there's a long and uh, a storied tradition uh, in Salem after the end of six months of legislative activity of 60 and 70 hour uh, weeks and weekends and evenings uh, in the uh, mosh pit that is Salem, uh, uh, that uh, lobbyists take some time off uh, and go into uh, hibernation and are made very scarce, uh, don't shave, don't put on a tie, um, sometimes don't bathe, um, uh, uh, but certainly don't have to come back and sit in front of a, a, a board. What they do is they come back to the office uh, droopy-eyed and uh, disheveled. They do their thank you notes, their legislative recap memo for their boss, and then they leave. However, uh, that's, and that's what Aaron has been doing. <clears throat> However, I uh, asked him to pry the adult beverage from his hand, uh, shave, put on a tie, and come in and be with you this morning. Because as the general manager said, uh, he was our uh, lead uh, uh, and point uh, person in Salem uh, for what I think, uh, without too much exaggeration, we can say is probably the best session that TriMet has had uh, in the last 20 years in Salem, if not ever. Uh, so I wanted to uh, ensure that he was here for you all to uh, acknowledge uh, the incredible work that he did this session. So, so I apologize to him for making him shave and put on a tie. Uh, so I want to do a quick recap, and Aaron will correct me. Uh, in the, I didn't uh, ask him to prep for this or deliver it because, you know, uh, he's thinking about other things. I can't things, string two words, sentences <laughs> together. So. <laughs> So uh, I'm going to I'm going to uh, uh, do this and uh, and then he can weigh in and and uh, correct me on anything that I've gotten wrong. So a uh, couple of success stories. Uh, one is uh, House Bill 2777, uh, which uh, uh, the general manager alluded to uh, briefly during your conversation about change in the exclusion ordinance. Uh, 
This was an idea that germinated uh, a couple of years ago um, that was uh, carried forward uh, by uh, 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 Mr. Supporta and uh, uh, Eric Van Hagen in, uh, in uh, uh, Ms. Devine's office, uh, where we wanted to find a different mechanism for dealing with minor ordinance violations, primarily fair violations, where um, Typically, uh, although it's a citation, it's adjudicated in uh, the county court system and uh, carries a fairly significant fine. A fair evasion uh, has a fairly significant fine. And not everyone can afford to pay the fine. Uh, not everyone is comfortable going to the courthouse and uh, appearing uh, before a judge or administrative uh, hearings officer to ask for a reduced fine, and what can happen out of that is that people ignore it, and uh, they then have a, a, an additional violation in, it, in addition to not paying their fare, they now have a, uh, an unaddressed uh, uh, ticket. Uh, they, if that goes on over a period of time, they can get multiple uh, citations, they can get an exclusion, and ultimately uh, they can end up uh, uh, you know, more enmeshed in the court system than, than a mere fair violation would warrant. So we were looking for an alternative to that. Um, uh, we worked uh, to introduce this legislation with the county uh, district attorney's offices for the three counties, and uh, we were successful. So we will have a new system uh, that allows those folks who choose uh, an alternative path to paying their fine uh, to ask for a reduced uh, fine if they pay their uh, fine in a, in a timely manner, or they can seek uh, a hearing for uh, a complete forgiveness of the fine, or they can ask for community service. Uh, and that'll be done all in a, a non-judicial setting, a, a much less formal uh, setting. Uh, the, the option of going through the court system is still there. Obviously, if they want to do that, they can do that. Um, uh, uh, that's always an option that's available to them through the process. So um, the upcoming work on this will be that, uh, that we need to draft, uh, uh, the legal team will draft uh, updated uh, uh, TriMet code to explain and, and define how that process will work. Uh, we will need to staff up that uh, process. It'll require some staffing on our part to administer and then uh, we'll need to execute community uh, uh, agreements with the community service organizations where folks can uh, do their community service if that's um, how they want to resolve the, the issue. We won't manage that directly, but we'll work with uh, community-based organizations to uh, identify opportunities for folks to, uh, to work off their fine. So that was a tremendous success, complicated, um, and worked out very well. Uh, a couple of other issues. Um, uh, one was uh, part defense, uh, uh, Senate Bill 357, uh, related to uh, interfering with uh, public transit. Uh, that's a, a, a you know fairly serious uh, crime and can and potentially lead to jail time. Often doesn't, but it could. Uh, and there was concern on the part of some legislators and others that um, mere uh, failure to pay could eventually uh, uh, end up being an IPT and you could in, uh, face jail time. Um, so we wanted to work with the legislators and address that concern without losing the tool of IPT for more serious uh, offenses against uh, operators or the system. Uh, and we were able to do that. <coughs> uh, we, we worked with Senator uh, Lou Frederick uh, pretty extensively on this and worked out a compromise uh, that you can no longer use IPT for fair evasion, uh, but you can for the other two offenses that uh, are covered under, under IPT. And that was a, a good compromise and it really didn't reduce the tools that we have because we had already agreed with the attorneys, uh, district attorneys in, in the three counties that they would not use the IPT for fair evasion. Um, one slight change on this one is that um it's reduced to class C for the first two, and then it's and then after the second one, it's bumped back up to a class A. Um, and Senator Frederick deserves 
most all of the credit for this one. He really forged forward and made this happen. Good, good, good uh, correction. And then uh, House Bill 32, uh, 3202, uh, this uh, legislation uh, relates to the Southwest Corridor project. Uh, for all of the light rail lines since the west side, we've had uh, a defined land use approval process uh, because they traverse multiple jurisdictions. Uh, they have a lot of complexity to them and they have a very um, short uh, federal timeline for securing federal matching funds. Um, and as many of you know, the Oregon land use appeals process isn't necessarily short. Um, and so this gives us a defined set of criteria that we have to meet and it also gives us a defined timeline and a accelerated review process uh, if there is a review. So that helps move that forward. Uh, that kept Aaron awake until the final day of session when it was, uh, when it was finally moved. <laughs> uh, a couple of other bills that uh, we were watching, one was a request uh, from uh, the senator from Forest Grove that we study light rail extension to Forest Grove. That didn't move out of committee. Another bill, which is kind of a perennial, which was uh, to give uh, jurisdiction, really any jurisdiction, the option of, of moving out of the TriMet district uh, or any subset of a jurisdiction for moving outside of the district and could create donut holes in the middle of the district and, and uh, really chaos. Uh, so uh, that w didn't move out of committee either. Uh, there was uh, uh, legislation to change the way the board is appointed uh, 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 and that was uh, also didn't move out of committee. And then as uh, Mr. Soporta mentioned earlier, House Bill 2717 was the bill that would have um, expanded uh, the uh, offense against uh, TriMet operators uh, that is currently in place to, in, it's, it's, that offense is only applied when an operator is in the, is under control of a vehicle. Um, and so if the operator parks the vehicle and goes back into the cab of the bus, to address an issue and they're assaulted, then it's a simple assault rather than this more um, stringent uh, 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 level of assault that um, the driver in operation of the vehicle has or a fare inspector or uh, if the operator is off of the bus using uh, the restroom, for example, or on their way to or from the, the break room. Uh, so there was an, an effort to expand that scope um, Whenever you uh, expand the scope of an offense, uh, there's, there's pushback uh, from uh, members of the Judiciary Committee who just don't like to see additional offenses added to the, to the list, um, and that was uh, partially the issue in this case. Um, ATU did take the lead on that bill. We didn't take the lead on it um, because uh, uh, it, it seemed like they had a good relationship and a, a good story to tell with uh, with the leadership of the Judiciary Committees. Um, but again, that, that bill didn't make it out of, uh, out of the committee. And then uh, House Bill 2017, which was the comprehensive transportation uh, uh, legislation that uh, uh, really uh, harkens back to a decade or more of work to try to uh, improve transportation resources around the state. When I started working for TriMet uh, in the early 90s, uh, my predecessor had been working on an effort to get uh, a statewide <coughs> general transit uh, funding mechanism from the state for probably 20 years. So 45, 50 years worth of effort to try to get a general transit operating resource for everyone in the state, not just uh, TriMet and Lane and, and uh, Salem and, and those districts that have been established over the years. Never happened until we left the Capitol and Aaron went to the Capitol mm -hmm. uh, and it happened this year. Uh, so uh, every corner of the state now will have some level of resource to do public transportation, whether it's Paisley or Burns or you know what have you, there'll be something. Um, and that's a tremendous uh, uh, sea change in the way that the state uh, supports public transportation. Um, the key elements of the package are that um, 
the generating area receives back 90% of what it produced. So the TriMet district will receive, receive back 90% of the revenue that it generates. Uh, and uh, the measure kicks in in July of uh, 2018. So the first implementation of the, of the new resource will be July of 18. We anticipate that we won't actually see revenue until January 1 of 19. It just takes a while for the Department of Revenue to process the receipts and turn around and write us the check. But after that, it flows uh, pretty regularly. So um, uh, we would expect in fiscal year 19 to receive about half a year's allocation, and then in uh, fiscal 20, uh, a full allocation. And uh, estimating that that would be somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, $40 million a year once it's, once it's up and running. Uh, one of the unique characteristics of this uh, legislation is that uh, TriMet receives the funding for the tri-county area, including the areas outside of our district, Wilsonville, Salem, and the you know, non-district areas of Washington County, uh, you know, Vernonia, and uh, places like that that don't have a district. And then we're responsible for sub-allocating those resources out to other recipients. So if you think about the STF uh, program that we bring to you every year, where we talk about sub-allocations that have been made, um, there'll be a process like that uh, that we'll come back to you with uh, in future years. Excuse me, Bernie. Yeah. Um, you said we'd be responsible in the Tri-County area, and then you've mentioned Salem, which is not in the Tri-County area. So Sorry. Did, uh, no, just, just the Multnomah County, Washington County, and Clackamas County, but the areas outside the TriMet District will allocate the funds out to them. Okay, yeah. so... Sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say Salem. Yeah, yeah. did you mean Sandy? Sandy, yes. Sorry, Thank you. Sandy, yes. Um, so there are a couple of requirements in the bill. Uh, one is that we um, have to develop, I mean, he's got these uh, bullet points out of order here. We have to appoint an advisory committee um, uh, made up of uh, citizens of the district. Uh, and then they give us input on uh, a plan, which uh, we then submit to uh, the Oregon Transportation Commission. So that's a little different from uh, the way we've operated in the past. It, it, historically, we haven't sort of reported back to the OTC before we're given a, authority to spend resources. Um, so they will uh, review our plan, and uh, if they are satisfied with it, they'll give us approval in the funds will flow after that. And then there's an annual reporting requirement in the legislation. Uh, they want to hear from us about uh, whether we're making progress on uh, expanding service to low-income communities, whether we're uh, developing uh, alternatives to uh, uh, diesel uh, fuel buses, whether we're working on a low-income fare program, and then uh, how we're working with uh, providing service inside and outside of the district and coordinating those efforts. Um, so the funds are available for uh, the general purposes of the district. Uh, we can use them on operating, on capital, buses. Uh, 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 they're pretty broadly uh, applicable funds. Uh, they can't be used for light rail, so that was the one caveat in the bill that they, they can't be used for uh, a light rail project. Uh, and then during the course of the legislation, uh, legislative discussion, uh, uh, Senator Dembro and, uh, and other legislators uh, asked us whether we would be willing to commit to implementing a low income fare if this new program uh, were successful. And, and we agreed uh, with those legislators that we would use the, the funding to implement a low-income fare program. So although it's not required in the legislation, we have a, an agreement with, uh, with the legislature that uh, TriMet will implement the, the low-income fare program, and, and Mr. Gardner will be talking about that uh, uh, immediately after this presentation, but that's, that's a commitment that we need to follow through on. So next steps uh, on implementation of uh, uh, House Bill 2017. Uh, first, the governor has to sign it. <laughs> uh, 
We expect, we expect that to happen. Uh, she hasn't expressed any concerns. Uh, but after that, uh, we need to identify uh, and impanel uh, the community advisory committee. Uh, uh, we need to do outreach, uh, both with uh, riders and, and uh, interest groups and with uh, the other jurisdictions to begin getting feedback on how they'd like to see these additional resources deployed. Uh, we will need to use, after we've gotten that feedback, we'll need to develop a ramp up strategy because depending on how we want to deploy those resources, it has implications for bus purchase orders, which have about a two year lead time on them. Uh, and we have additional operators that need to be brought into the hiring pipeline and additional mechanics. And there's, you know, a, about a two year lead time on mechanics as well. So. Um, we, there, it's not like you can just turn the switch and the, the service goes out on the street. There's quite a bit of lead time on some of the, uh, on some of the options that we would have before us. And then of course, moving forward on the low income fare. Sorry, yeah. Bernie. Oh, questions. There you go. Um, we, so we'll distribute money to the outlying districts in the three county area. Does our plan have to reflect what they want to do, or are they developing their own plans with their own advisory committee in there? They'll they'll be developing their own yeah, plans. I think for you know Wilsonville and Sandy and and the and the areas that are, have a district or a city uh, service like Wilsonville, they'll do it. Uh, for the areas that aren't covered, rural Washington County, et cetera, I think we'll probably consult on that and take that under our wing as well because we have the resources to do that. Of the funds be determined. Uh, is there a formula for that then? There isn't, a, there is at the statewide level. So um, the, the tri-county area will receive 90% back of the funds that it generates. Um, within the region, there's not, it's not spelled out in the legislation exactly how the, the funds will be distributed, but I think the expectation is that the sub allocations will reflect that same formula. Okay. That Wilsonville will get what it Wilsonville generated, Sandy will get what Sandy generated, to the extent that sometimes it gets a little difficult to get the data, but as close as we can get to those. So how much, so you are not in a position to say what portion of what comes to TriMet would stay with TriMet? Well, the numbers that I gave you, the about $40 million a year, are just the TriMet portion. Okay, so that's what you. we expect to generate based on the existing TriMet payroll tax, there, extrapolating from There that. are some um, pieces in the legislation talking about targets and what they want, um, and um, areas outside of mass transit districts and transportation districts um, ha will have to submit plans on how they're going to spend the money and have that approved by the OTC. So um, they will need to come and say, here's what we want to do with the money, and then OTC will have input on it. And TriMet is mostly, I think, going to be in a management of making sure, you know, consulting and not deciding, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, I have a couple of things. Um, Having spent four months in, in the legislature myself. Thank you, Joe. I never saw Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> that's because he, as he was, he was in, in, uh, in their offices twisting their I, arms. I know, he was, uh, what, anyway, he, wasn't he did a great job. I wanna, I wanna also echo what you said, Bernie. Um, and I wanna, I wanna point out for those of you who don't know how all the sausage is made down there that this was, uh, a year-long project around the state, bipartisan. And I just really want to emphasize that. Uh, surprisingly, some of the, bi the bigger players were from Burns, you know, and uh, there were a lot of long meetings, a lot of rumors, duh. And uh, this should set the table for a lot of things in the future, not mm -hmm. only for TriMet, but statewide uh, on the transit problems around the state. And uh, I want to say that I, I, I cannot be a lobbyist for TriMet, 
but I gave information out about the low-income fare, about the adjudication, and about the assault bills on, on drivers. And just so you know, it isn't just for ATU, it's for all drivers in the state of Oregon who in a transit agency. So, like you said, we took a run at it. Um, there's always next time. So, anyway, uh, the team did great. So, I concur. And I would just note that uh, our board president was in on the ground floor mm -hmm. of that yeah. conversation statewide as part of the governor's vision task force um, and spent a great deal of last summer, summer before, yeah. and a yeah. long time ago, yeah. uh, spent a lot of time uh, around the state listening to those concerns. Um, and then that was followed up with the legislative task force that did uh, essentially the same thing, heard those same concerns, and that all built the momentum that allowed um, good people like Aaron to actually uh, bring this uh, this bill into fruition. If, if I might, uh, Mr. General Manager, uh, uh, two two thoughts. Uh, uh, I, I agree with Director Esmond. Two of the biggest champions of uh, of the program the, and the transit portion of the bill uh, were uh, Republicans. Uh, uh, House member Cliff Bentz from Ontario, who is just about as far away from Portland as you can get. Uh, he's not even in the same time zone we are in. Right. Uh, it was a very strong advocate and across the aisle and uh, having a Republican on the House side advocating for this within his caucus was incredibly important. And uh, Senator Brian Boquist uh, on, the, on the Senate side, um, very, very, um, collegial, bipartisan, bicameral approach to this. Uh, in, in the current era that we're in, it's really heartening yeah. to see that uh, we, can, we can do that. Um, we can play nice, and good things come out of that process. The second thing is that um, none of this conversation could have happened unless TriMet was in a position, because we are the largest beneficiary of these funds, None of this could have happened without this agency uh, having put itself in a position where it had answered questions that have been raised over the last 10 years uh, in a positive, uh, decisive, uh, and, and uh, professional way. So the Secretary of State's audit, uh, the response to that, put to rest uh, many, many questions in Salem, rumors and, you know, uh, fake news, uh, if you will, around the building uh, were addressed as part of that audit. The um, collective bargaining agreement that was struck uh, and negotiated and, and approved by the board, uh, changing the, really the course of history of the organization in terms of its future financial situation, uh, uh, leading an agency and building an agency that is not just well-known and respected, uh, you know, in the region, but around the country. That foundation had to be laid and was fundamental to uh, being even in the ballgame, uh, because without those, uh, those questions being answered, there would have been a lot more um, running around the building trying to put fires out, uh, as opposed to working with the legislators on how we can grow the system. A lot of work went into the success. Sorry. Yeah, and I would just like to say that this session, everybody in TriMet should take it very personally. We, it was a team effort. All right, thank you both. And would you please pass on thanks to all the others who were involved. I, and Aaron, I know you were down there a lot. I saw you in action. You respected and people uh, listen uh, and, and connect with you. So, uh, so good work. This is a, it is a team effort, and I really appreciate it. The only other thing I would say is I'm watching the poor folks from Opal trying to take lots of notes. I don't think we had this presentation in our packets, did we? No, no and, sorry. And, and if we did, I, what I would suggest is maybe we make copies so, sure. or send them an electronic version so they have that uh, trying, instead of trying to take all the notes that I saw them trying to take back there. So, so good work. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Portfair, members of the board, if I could bring up John Gardner. So speaking of um, the Low Income Fair program, uh, this is a very, I think, desirable time for John to give you a, 
quick update on where we are with that process. Um, probably step back just a little bit to describe how we got here and then looking sort of roadmap ahead about where we can end up uh, in terms of implementing this program, thanks to the new revenue that we just heard about. So, John? Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, President Warner, members of the board. Apparently I'm batting clean up a little bit here, but uh, it's a good lineup. So yeah, to, to what Neil said, I'd like to give a little bit more uh, perspective on sort of TriMet's three-year journey to this point. Um, I think it was brought up earlier this morning about Access Transit, which this board authorized in 2013, which was sort of our first foray into a low-income fare program, providing uh, $1.3 million in essentially free fare through tickets and day passes to about 70 community-based organizations who then disseminated those over the last three years. That program has grown to $1.5 million. But shortly after that was enacted, Neil McFarland, Bernie Bottomley, and my predecessor, John L. Bell, began thinking through what a low-income fare program could look like for this agency in this region. And as uh, my predecessor passed on, or moved on, sorry, um, <laughs> I was able to, to, to take up that conversation, and it was actually part of the interview process and a, and a question poised, posed to me in 2015 from Neil about what would I do, how would I go about uh, pursuing it because it was an agency priority. And to be fair, it was probably the last thing I needed to hear from TriMet's leadership in terms of a commitment to equity, a commitment to our transit-dependent riders, and a commitment from leadership to continue to make this agency and the system more accessible, which was really part of the, my decision-making process from coming here in the first place. So of course, fast forward in last spring, 2016, was the first time we began talking to you about our formal efforts to pursue a low-income fare program. So that effort started with some very comprehensive research from, in partnership with Four Nines, who looked across the country and found 11 examples of low-income fare program models, five of which have had components that would work with our eFare Hop FastPass system that we could look to, programs in San Francisco, San Diego, up in King County, uh, and other places that we can really look at lessons learned. The concept of a, of a low-income fare program is still relatively new around the country, but there are good enough milestones in those examples that made it possible to convene a regional task force to begin to look at what could that be in our own community. And I think you heard it earlier this morning in terms of who participated in that. Not only were we able to have folks like Opal and BRU and other community-based organizations, but we also had 11 elected officials, folks like Commissioner Dick Scouten, Mayor Danny Doyle, uh, industry, association folk, industry association folks like Pam Treese and others so to make a committee of 22 folks that uh, Neil McFarlane and Sam Chase, Metro Councilor Sam Chase, uh, convened over the course of five months and, and uh, Director um, Bruce Warner was on that committee as well. And so that committee worked first to sort of identify the opportunities that existed in, in our community to pursue a program, but also the framework of such a program and even the potential funding stream. And where we landed was a program that would allow for eligibility of folks up to 200% of federal poverty. And for an individual, that's about $23,700. And for those of you who follow Oregon's minimum wage, that would allow the minimum wage increase that just occurred in Oregon to make folks who are just making minimum wage eligible for this program. Uh, so if you're working full-time, 2,000 hours a year, you would still be able to access this program. And obviously, if you have dependents, your uh, eligibility grows. And the subsidy for the program uh, was recommended at 50% of the single passes and 70% of the monthly pass. So it aligns perfectly with our efforts around youth fairs, but also with our honored citizen program. And this is important because it makes the actual future implementation a little bit more manageable because that's how uh, we can integrate it with our eFair or hot fast pass system. What would that look like? Well, fully subscribed, the program uh, estimated cost or budget is about $12.3 million. And that would allow us to support up to 90,000 uh, uh, registered uh, users of the program. For context, King County has been in operation for about three years, and they're at 45,000 uh, uh, members of their program. So obviously, we have room to go within our implementation plan. So um, it was timely that uh, we decided to uh, throw our hat in, into the crowded ring of the legislature to secure and, and seek funding. Uh, we were warned against it because obviously the, the session began in a, in a hole, a budgetary hole. But we thought the idea of connecting to long-term sustainability funding, which was part of the 
sort of core concepts when we imagined this program made a lot of sense. And the fact that there was a transportation package already uh, being discussed and we can sort of leverage that conversation to sort of secure funding made a lot of sense as well. And so it's funny you spoke to Aaron earlier. Aaron, actually, we took a group of uh, local electeds and community partners, including our OPAL partners, down to Salem to advocate to legislators. And Aaron, just being on time and ready to support us, provided additional collateral to explain our efforts around low-income fares when we ran out because there was so much interest in our presentations and our individual meetings. So I remember texting him and saying, hey, do you have more of these? And, but it was a great way to sort of uh, uh, visualize and, and communicate the message of what we were trying to achieve in a low-income fare program. And, and hands down, we have no, uh, I mean, there's a lot of support. So although it took the whole session to get it passed, our, our, we were very impressed and encouraged by that effort. So as you've heard already, mission accomplished in terms of securing a long-term funding source to sort of implement this program. So what's next? Uh, we need to re-engage our regional low-income fare task force members. Um, there's a, as you can imagine, hundreds of community-based organizations, nonprofits, and transit system stakeholders we're going to have to, and we want to engage over the next few months. Obviously, our Transit Equity and Advisory Council is get, committee is going to play a, a major role in this. And there are huge system partners. Where we've seen this program or these types of programs work is when uh, system partners like the Department of Human Services, public housing, uh, public employment uh, agencies like WorkSource, when they're engaged in part of the system, because they already have mechanisms to verify eligibility in place in terms of uh, income verification and whatnot, we want them as well as community-based organizations to be part of the implementation plan. Um, and we're still in the process of developing our own local implementation plan. We're going to be visiting our friends up in, in north in Seattle to look more closely at uh, Orca Lift and their, their low-income fare program. And this time go a little bit underneath the hood to understand better lessons learned, things they might have done in hindsight and things we can learn from before we start getting deep into our own program. Obviously this project's going to take a lot of communication and public engagement to make sure when we're ready to start, we start off on the right foot and people have a sense of how they can connect with this resource. And as you've heard already, the funding begins to accrue next July 2018. So for the next year, it's really about how do we put our system and our partners in a position of readiness to be able to launch the program as soon as we can to that date. So roughly what that looks like for our purposes is the next five to six months of program development. Everything from the statement of work of potential contracts to the marketing and the communication plan to many, many community forums to get insight and ideas about how best to position eligibility or verification sites, um, what sort of considerations we need to make sure are part of the operational implementation <coughs> plan, um, and develop intergovernment agreements with potential uh, system partners, as well as to, to work on board resolutions because this would be require a board resolutions to move forward. So we feel like that's going to be the next five to six months. Then we'll be working on procurement to make sure we have identified partners who can fulfill and, and provide the service to the customers and signing them up. And much like Hot Fast Pass, we hope to be in a position to test the, the actual um, loading and usage of the program late fall, early summer. Um, and be in a position to distribute cards through our access transit partners, but also through the contracted service providers to launch a, a, a low-income fare program late next summer, a little bit ahead of the funding, and obviously that's still to be determined because of the way the resources are going to work, but we feel like this timeline puts us in the best position to be ready as soon as the resources are ready. So that's sort of the 10,000-foot level, and we, we can go into greater detail as you like, but um, questions, please. John, um, help me to understand about the, the existing 1.5 million and that program, and will that continue, or um, you know, how might that change as a result of, of this program? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question, and I'm, my hope is that it would continue. It, it will change, I think, and how that looks remains to be determined, but just to give you uh, context for what Access Transit is, it's really short-term um, subsidized transit support, where I would argue the low-income fare program is more long-term working poor uh, folks who need more than just uh, a ticket to get to their social service appointment or a, a, a pass, a book of tickets to get through the week. This is a program that makes transit more affordable and accessible to 
tens of thousands of folks, as opposed to those just-in-time emergency um, distribution of the access transit resources. You know, obviously one of the, the big issues that we're going to have to deal with, too, is if we are able to implement this before the money starts flowing, where and how do we come up with the money to support it in those early periods? Um, and I, I foresee a lot of discussion and internal work on that. And I'm, I'm asking if, if on this uh, program implementation timeline, if you could include uh, a w work element for that also. Um, you know, obviously we heard some concern this morning about holding off until the money starts flowing, because that's January 2019. It's an awful hard thing to make people wait that long. Um, but on the other hand, I want to make sure that we don't do damage to other, you know, pressing needs within TriMet organizations coming up with the money. And, and at, right at this point, I don't know how we're going to do it. Right. So I, th I think it's, it's a significant enough issue. You know, I'd like to s see that captured as part of the work program. Well, and to be fair, part of this was my learning process because I heard, <laughs> oh, the money accrues July 18th, and I was like, well, how do we, how do we reverse engineer the readiness to be available? But as Bernie reported, it becomes accruable, but, but there's no actual resource right. until January. So yes, more time would be better to do this right, but my goal is still with as much time as we can use to be ready when we can actually afford to implement the program. Yeah. And my, my belief is we'll be talking about that in our budget development yeah. for next year that year and, and talk about how we actually do bridge that gap if that's what we want to do. Yeah. Anything else? Thank you very much, John. Thank Good you. report. And congratulations. It's nice to have this. Mr. General Manager, do you have anything else? No, nothing more unless there are questions from the board. Thank you. I think we're done. Thank you very much. Thank you.